My name is Ben Shepard, and this happened to me in September of 1994. I'm a National Park Ranger, stationed in the Appalachian Mountains, Blue Ridge Parkway to be exact. Been working these woods for longer than I care to remember. My old man was a ranger too, the best kind. I kind of grew up in these forests. That fall, things started to feel off. It started subtly, barely noticeable like a shift in the breeze. Rangers started reporting hikers going missing. No bodies, no sign of struggle, just vanished off the trails. They blamed folks getting lost, disoriented, but deep down, I felt there was something more. Like a chill wind coming from a place you couldn't see. Then came the stories from other rangers at night, out on patrol. They'd claim to hear footsteps in the underbrush when they were out alone, feel like they were being followed, despite the silence. One old-timer, a guy named Flynn, even said he swore he saw eyes, big, glowing yellow eyes peering back at him from the tree line, disappearing in a blink. The higher-ups laughed it off, stress, bad moonshine, usual dismissals. One evening, I was closing up a section of the parkway when I stumbled on it myself, the cause for all the unsettling stories. Deep in the woods, off a little-used maintenance trail, I found a clearing. And in the center of it, bones. Piles of them, gnawed and cracked. Deer, bear, sure, but something else mixed in. Bones too big, too oddly shaped. And scattered amongst the animal remains— torn bits of clothing, a mangled backpack. My heart pounded in my chest. This wasn't natural, not normal at all. Right then, my radio crackled with Flynn's voice, panicked. Said he was out on the trail, said he saw it, the thing that was making those eyes. Then the audio cut out. I ran, following the trail towards the spot he'd radioed in from. Every instinct told me to go back, get help. But Flynn had been like family, and my gut said he was in trouble. Night was falling fast when I reached the edge of the woods, peering into an overgrown meadow. And there, in the waning light, it stood. The creature. I couldn't make out all the details, but the sheer scale of it was enough to make my knees wobble. Close to ten feet tall, covered in matted fur that shimmered silver in the moonlight. Its arms were like tree trunks, its hands tipped with claws that ripped into the earth. And the head, that was worst. A mix of wolf and man, twisted and wrong, yellow eyes blazing. For a heartbeat, we just stood there, frozen. Then, it let out a roar that echoed through the mountains. The raw sound of fury and hunger— Flynn cried out from somewhere in the meadow, his voice filled with pain and terror. That snapped me into action. I charged forward, yelling, trying to draw the creature away. It turned, and in the dim light, its teeth flashed in a grotesque grin. I heard Flynn scream again, and the sound cut off abruptly. The creature turned back towards me, and for a second, I thought about running. But Flynn was out there, maybe even still alive, and that creature wasn't going to let me go without a fight. My heart was a drumbeat in my ears as I raised my rifle, more of an act of defiance than actual strategy. I hadn't even reloaded since firing warning shots at a mama bear a few weeks back. This thing, bullets wouldn't even slow it down. Yet I aimed. The creature stalked closer its eyes fixated on me. I squeezed the trigger. The shot echoed useless. It roared and lunged. I braced, then silence. My eyes flew open. The creature had stopped just feet in front of me, its massive form frozen in mid-pounce. Confused, I scrambled back, then noticed what had stopped it in its tracks. A flickering headlamp, bobbing through the trees. Then a voice, gruff and familiar. Don't move. That thing hates light. 
It was old man Flynn. Battered and bleeding, but miraculously alive. He dragged himself into view, one hand clutching the headlamp, the other an old, heavy-duty flashlight. As he got closer, the creature hissed and retreated a few steps, its eyes narrowing against the concentrated beams. Keep those lights on it. Flynn croaked, his face pale. Come on, move! I didn't need telling twice. Stumbling to my feet, I shuffled towards Flynn. The creature watched, snarling, but the fearsome predator from before seemed held at bay by the harsh light, unable to approach. Flynn collapsed against a tree, and I knelt beside him. His leg was twisted at an unnatural angle, the bone jutting through torn skin. Hold this. He thrust the heavy flashlight at me. Aim it straight at that thing. With shaking hands, I took the flashlight. Its beams seemed to make the creature agitated, keeping it at a distance as I helped Flynn splint his leg, fashioning a makeshift support from branches. The whole time, we kept those lights trained on the predator, its snarls filling the night. When the makeshift splint was secured, Flynn slumped back, exhausted. They told me I was crazy, he rasped, a dark chuckle rasping in his throat. Said it was bears, wildcats, never believed they'd believe this. Suddenly, the creature charged again, a blur of dark fur and aggression. We both screamed, holding the light steady. It stopped short, as if hitting an invisible wall. Then it paced back and forth, watching us with calculating eyes. Can't hold it forever, Flynn muttered. Sun's coming up soon, but... He trailed off, grimacing. We both knew what that meant. We'd be sitting ducks come daylight. That's when I saw it, the fire lookout tower flashing on a distant ridge, an old beacon hardly ever used anymore. Maybe, just maybe. I laid out my plan to Flynn, a desperate gamble at best. He nodded slowly wincing as he shifted his injured leg. Crazy enough to work, he grunted. With Flynn providing cover, keeping the creature pinned with the flashlights, I crept backwards into the undergrowth. I had to get to the base of the tower, unseen, if this had any chance. Inch by painful inch, I moved, the creature pacing restlessly as it sensed me pulling away. Then I was free of its sight line, scrambling towards the tower on my belly. The base of the tower was an old metal shed, filled with outdated equipment and forgotten maps. Inside I struck gold flares. I grabbed them, heart pounding, then began the terrifying climb up the narrow ladder of the tower. The creature must have sensed the change of elevation because it roared in frustration, scrabbling against the base of the tower as I reached the top. I secured myself, heart in my throat, and fumbled with the flare. Flickering crimson light sparked to life, and with a prayer I hurled it down. The flare bounced off a rock near the creature and exploded. It screeched, recoiling from the blinding flash. Encouraged, I lit another and another, tossing them into the clearing. The creature thrashed and howled clearly in pain from the sudden bursts of light. I didn't stop, my hands shaking as I fumbled for the last flare. And then, as dawn broke, the creature turned and fled, disappearing into the forest with astonishing speed. When the search team finally arrived, we told them the unbelievable truth. They found footprints larger than any bear, the clearing littered with bones. Whatever that creature was, it was still out there. The aftermath was a blur. Flynn recovered, though he walked with a limp for the rest of his days. I never saw the creature again, but I feel it sometimes. A prickling at the back of my neck. That lingering sense of being watched from the encroaching darkness of the trees. We got transferred, both of us. Bad for morale, this kind of thing. 
the suit said, sweeping it all under the rug. I moved on, got a desk job pushing paper instead of patrolling trails safer, they said. Maybe. But sometimes, in the dead quiet of my office, I swear I can smell the rankness of the woods, hear the echoing roar, and feel the heat of those burning yellow eyes fixed on me in the deep, unending dark. The swamps of Louisiana, they always had an air of danger about them. I'd fished those waters my whole life, knew them like the back of my hand. My name is Elias. Some folks call me Swamp Fox, because I always seem to make it out, no matter how thick the tangled undergrowth gets or how high the water rises. But that summer of 1978, even I got more than I bargained for. I had my catfishing lines out near a little traveled bayou. It was a place I'd stumbled on a few years back, deep in the marsh, and the catfish there seemed to grow as big as gators. My pirogue was tied to a cypress knee, and I was dozing with a beer in hand. The sun was dipping low, painting the whole swamp in hues of blood orange and sickly green. That's when I saw it, a ripple in the water, moving against the current. I sat up alert. Nothing out here that size should move like that. It surfaced again, perhaps twenty feet away from me. In the half-light, it looked massive and slick with algae, with a long, flat head and two eyes that glinted like gold coins. Not an alligator, not a snake. I scrambled up, my heart drumming, and grabbed my shotgun. It was propped against the side of the pirogue. Before I could get a good aim, the thing surged out of the water. It rose high seven, eight feet tall, and I realized what it was in a burst of horrified recognition, a catfish. But not like any catfish I'd ever seen, or even dreamt of in my worst nightmares. Its whiskers were as thick as tree roots, its mouth a gaping maw that could swallow me whole. The sheer size and wrongness of it struck me speechless even as it slammed down into the water right beside the boat. The pirogue rocked violently. My shotgun went clattering into the swamp, disappearing with a disheartening splash. I stumbled, barely managing to keep my balance as water sloshed over the sides. Terror lent me speed. I fumbled for the outboard, yanking the starter cord, cursing as the engine wheezed and coughed but failed to catch. The catfish resurfaced beside me, its mouth snapping at the edge of the boat. I grabbed the paddle, struck out blindly, aiming for its gleaming eye. It gave a hiss, like air escaping a broken pipe, and pulled back, the blow glancing off its monstrous head. I dug the paddle in and pushed back, trying to put distance between us, but the pirogue felt sluggish, weighed down in the stern. My stomach lurched as I realized the thing had its jaws clamped around the outboard motor. The wood of the pirogue groaned and splintered. Another surge, and I lost my balance entirely, tumbling into the murky, chest-deep water. Panic threatened to drown me, but something cold and primal deep in my gut took over. I thrashed to the surface, gasping, my eyes frantic. There it was, a shadowed bulk circling me, its fins cutting the water like knives. I splashed towards the cypress tree where my boat had been tied, every nerve screaming. My fingers scrabbled on the thick, wet roots and I hauled myself upwards. The catfish followed, its eyes fixed on me as it rose from the water once more, snapping its jaws in fury as I dangled just out of reach. I scrambled higher up the tree, the rough bark scraping my palms. Below, the relentless creature thrashed and battered the trunk. Heart pounding in my ears, I realized I was trapped. There was nowhere to go but down, right into those waiting jaws. 
A glint of metal in the water caught my eye my fishing tackle box wedged in the cypress roots. Inside I had a heavy hunting knife, a lucky charm from my great-granddaddy. I stretched out, reaching for the box with trembling hands, not daring to take my eyes off the monster below. I managed to dislodge the tackle box, fumbled with the latch, and pulled out the knife, its hefty weight grounding me in the moment. The catfish lunged forward, a mountain of scales and muscle. I screamed, more a war cry than a sound of terror, and jumped. It all happened in a rush. The impact as I hit the water again, the pain as teeth glanced off my arm, the burning in my lungs, and then I was slicing wildly with the knife. I felt the blade hit something solid, then slide and slice again. I surfaced choking, my vision blurring. The catfish was thrashing wildly, dark shapes churned the water. I couldn't tell if it was blood or just the mud stirred up in its frenzy. With a sob, I hauled myself back onto the cypress roots, clutching the bloody knife and gasping for breath. The thrashing slowly subsided. I didn't dare look. The sun was sinking below the horizon, casting the world in an eerie crimson glow. Swamp mosquitoes whined in my ears. I stayed frozen on that root, shivering, waiting for the creature to reappear but the swamp remained eerily quiet. As darkness fell, I found a length of rope in the wreckage of the pirogue and used it to haul myself higher up the tree. I spent the night there, clinging to the branches with one arm while the other ached with what I feared was a nasty bite. Sleep, of course, was out of the question. In the gray light of dawn, I lowered myself back down, every muscle screaming. The catfish was gone. There was no trace of it, save for a few glistening scales shimmering dully in the swamp mud. I staggered to the remains of my boat, retrieved a tarp, and fashioned a makeshift bandage from my wound. My teeth chattered as I pushed off back towards civilization, not sure if I was delirious from fever or the shock of it all. The tow truck driver gave me a long, disbelieving stare when I finally hailed him down on a gravel road, hours later. I must have been a sight, covered in mud, blood, and swamp water, clutching my granddaddy's knife. But he didn't say a word, just took me straight to the hospital. Word got around after that. Folks thought I was spinning tails, or had gotten into a mess with bootleggers. I didn't bother to correct them. Some things, you just have to see to believe, and even then, your mind tries to tell you it's all a bad dream. I still fish sometimes, but I stick a lot closer to the beaten path these days. Never did go back to that bayou. That catfish, it could still be out there, lurking beneath the muddy water, growing bigger every year, waiting. They patched me up at the hospital some torn muscles and a hell of a lot of stitches. I even managed to convince the doctor a gator had gotten me, easier to explain than the truth. I stayed with my cousin in town for a while, jumpy, haunted by the gleam of those catfish eyes in my sleep. Couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't done with the swamp creature, that it was somehow still connected to me. News traveled back to my reservation. The elders came to see me, listening intently to my story. My grandfather, a man known for his wisdom and few words, simply nodded gravely and said, Biogwa. I'd never heard the name. But something in his tone, the deep respect laced with a hint of fear, told me this was more than just a monster tale. Later, when we were alone, my grandfather explained. Biogwa, he said, was an ancient spirit, a guardian of the watery places. It took many forms, but some said the catfish was its favored guise. In times long ago, when the tribe lived in those same bayous, the Ogwa had protected them. But as the world changed, as men forgot the old ways, the balance had been broken. I struggled with that. 
Was this some kind of punishment? Or a warning? The thought of that creature, driven by hunger or rage or something even more unknowable, sent shivers down my spine. Despite the gnawing terror, a strange determination began to grow in me. If the old war was out of balance, maybe I could help bring that balance back. Some old debt of kinship, maybe, from my ancestors to its kind. Weeks turned into months. I healed, grew stronger. Spent my days fishing, not for sport, but for sustenance. I left offerings in the swamp fish, cornmeal, even tobacco, as my grandfather instructed. I spoke to the water, to the trees, apologizing for the arrogance of men, and promising respect for the old ways. There was no sign of the massive catfish, but as the rituals became habit, a feeling of peace began to replace the constant dread. Then came the storm. Hurricane season brought a surge that flooded the whole region. Evacuations were ordered, but I dug in, stubborn and certain of my path. From my vantage point, a small shack on stilts passed down in my family for generations. The storm had a monstrous, living quality to it. It tore at the land, ripping trees from the ground, the rain slashing down from an angry sky. Yet, in the heart of the chaos, I sensed a different kind of power at work, the echoes of that terrible day on the bayou. Night fell in the height of the storm, the wind screaming, the shack groaning and shaking. That's when I saw it. Bursting through the flooded cypress grove came the Ogwa not as a catfish fully materialized, but as a swirling vortex of water and wind. It ripped through the trees like they were matchsticks, heading straight from my shack, some primal force drawing it towards me. I stumbled outside, feeling the force of the storm trying to tear me from the porch. In a flash of lightning, I saw it, eyes burning in the center of that raging mass. But not with anger, not anymore. There was a focused intensity there, a sense of purpose that cut straight through the chaos. Then, the impossible happened. The Ogwa swirled around me, encasing me for a breathless moment in its watery embrace. I felt a surge, a jolt like static charge, and in that instant, I understood. Not with words, but with raw, instinctive certainty. The Ogwa needed a conduit a bridge between this world and its own. I had the blood of the old ones, the connection it needed to fulfill its purpose. The storm surge was at its peak. I knew what I had to do. Taking a deep, shivering breath, I stepped out of the shack and into the maelstrom. Pain flared as the Ogwa lashed against me, but under it, there was strength, a joining of spirits. With every step, I felt myself changing, dissolving into the vortex, becoming rain and wind. I screamed, not in fear, but in exhilaration. In the heart of the storm, I became one with the Ogwa. I felt its hunger, not for flesh, but for balance. The hurricane tore up the land, yes, but under my guidance, under its power, it also cleansed. It swept away houses built on poisoned earth, tore down rusted metal structures left to fester, and flooded fields tainted with chemicals. The hurt was real, but amidst the destruction, I felt the potential for renewal. When dawn finally came, the storm had passed. I stood on the mud-slick shore of the bayou, human once more, but irrevocably altered. I knew that the Ogwa was still out there, in the depths, the swirl of the current, the sighing of the wind in the trees. Maybe, some would say I had died that night, become part of some swamp spirit legend whispered amongst the old ones. In a way, they wouldn't be wrong. But the man who walked back to my reservation wasn't just Elias anymore. I had become something more, a bridge between worlds. And as crazy as it sounds, amidst the wreckage of the storm-wracked land, I felt a glimmer of hope.
I settled back into the driver's seat of my truck in 1994, just off Old Highway 14 in Wyoming. Time to head home before nightfall. It had been another long day at the reservation clinic. I'm Joseph Blackfeather, by the way, dock on the Wind River Reservation. The sun dipped low in the western sky, the long shadows making the Bighorn Mountains look menacing. I'd been feeling off the last couple of days. An unsettled feeling, like someone was keeping an eye on me. I shook it off. Probably just the stress of the job. This place weighs on your soul sometimes. I flicked on the headlights as twilight crept over the hills. I had twenty miles to home, a lonely stretch of road lined with wind-blasted scrub and tumbleweeds. The radio reception was spotty out here, just static scratching between the few country stations. Then I saw it. A flash of movement on the side of the road. I hit the brakes hard, the truck shuddering to a halt. My heart slammed in my chest. Had an animal darted in front of me? I reversed slowly, peering into the dimming light. Nothing. I must have imagined it. Nerves, I told myself, nerves. Still, a prickling worry crawled up my neck. I decided to get a move on. As my truck lumbered forward, a hulking shape burst from the roadside brush. It barreled towards the truck with shocking speed. I slammed my foot down on the gas pedal, tires squealing as the vehicle lurched forward. The thing was immense, taller than any man with long, gangly limbs. Its mottled gray skin was thick and leathery, and its eyes glowed with an eerie yellow light. Instinctively, I swerved, narrowly avoiding the creature as it lunged. Its claws raked the side of my truck, leaving deep gouges in the metal. I glanced in the rearview mirror. The creature crouched in the dust, watching me. A chill ran down my spine, Fear propelled me onward. I didn't know what I'd just seen, but I knew I didn't want to find out. My foot pressed harder on the gas, the speedometer needle trembling as the truck strained. The road stretched ahead, a ribbon of cracked asphalt cutting through the desolation. I was nearing the reservation border when I saw headlights in the distance another vehicle coming my way. My heartbeat quickened, relief flooding over me. As the oncoming car got closer, I realized something was wrong. It was moving erratically, swerving from side to side, then it careened off the road, leaving a cloud of dust. Panic clenched my guts. I pulled my truck over. I had to help. My medical bag was on the back seat, and I grabbed it in a hurry, slamming the door shut behind me. I ran towards the overturned vehicle. It was an SUV, tipped onto its side. The driver's side window was smashed, and there was blood everywhere. I edged closer, my stomach churning. The driver was a man, slumped over the steering wheel, his face a mask of pain, and horror frozen on his features. It was a nasty head wound. I had to get him out of there. I reached through the broken window and tried to find a pulse. Nothing. My eyes flicked to the rearview mirror. Through the swirling dust, I saw it, the creature. It crouched on the edge of the road, watching the scene with its burning eyes. I stumbled back, dread washing over me. The creature was somehow responsible for this. But how? It wasn't natural whatever it was. And then I remembered the stories. Grandpa used to tell me tales by the firelight, old Lakota legends about creatures that lurked in this desolate land. Stories about the Wakinian, the Thunder Beings. They were powerful, dangerous, to be avoided at all costs. I looked back at the overturned SUV. Had this creature, had this Wakinian caused the accident? Were the old stories true? The creature moved. Its loping stride carried it across the road towards me. 
I bolted back toward my truck, fumbling for the keys with shaking hands. I jumped behind the wheel, slamming the door just as the creature reached the truck. Its claws raked along the metal, the sound grating my nerves. I started the engine, the headlights cutting through the darkness. The creature crouched in the beam of light for a moment, its eyes reflecting yellow, then it backed off into the shadows. I reversed, my eyes darting from the road to the rearview mirror, half expecting the creature to give chase. But it seemed to have vanished. Shaking, I put the truck in drive and tore away. I didn't stop again until I reached the reservation. The incident with the SUV shook me to the core. Of course, I reported it to the tribal police, but the description I gave, well, let's just say they didn't take it seriously. Nobody believed me. But I knew what I had seen. I knew it was out there. The encounter changed me. Now, I spend a lot of time driving the back roads of the reservation on the lookout. I carry a rifle in my truck, just in case. Some nights... I think I catch a glimpse of those yellow eyes in the moonlit shadows. I hear the rasping sound of something moving through the brush. The fear prickles at my skin. I know the creature, the Wakinian, is still out there. Hunting. Waiting. always thought I was smart about the outdoors. Names Everett, Everett Gaines. Hiked since I was a kid, did some serious climbs in my younger days. Never the type to panic, always got backup plans. But what happened up in those mountains? Well, let's just say even the best planning won't save you when the wilderness itself turns against you. It was 1991 and I was itching to explore a remote trail in Olympic National Park. Not the popular stuff, but an old logging route, barely used anymore. Figured I'd have the solitude I craved. First couple days were pure heaven. Lush old-growth rainforest, silence so thick you could almost touch it. But on day three, things started to shift. It wasn't obvious at first. Just the feeling of being watched, the air getting heavier somehow. Then the wildlife started going nuts. Not scared off, but agitated. Birds screeching in crazy patterns, squirrels chittering nonstop. My instincts were screaming, but I chalked it up to nerves. Until that night. Woke from a dead sleep to an earth-shaking howl. Like a wolf, but deeper, and something about the cadence— wrong. Then it came again, closer, and a second joined in, a horrifying duet echoing through the valley. I lay frozen, a cold sweat starting despite the sleeping bag. Whatever those things were, they weren't natural. Dawn couldn't come fast enough. Broke camp in record time, heart thrumming a panicked rhythm. But my plan root back. It was wrong. Trees weren't where I remembered them, the undergrowth thicker, blocking paths that should have been open. Every time I thought I'd regained my bearings, it'd shift again, subtly but definitely. By afternoon, I was forced to admit the truth, I was lost. Not just misplaced, but well and truly turned around in a forest that seemed to be twisting itself in defiance of all logic. Panic threatened to bubble up, but I fought it back. Got to my high ground, trying to pick out landmarks, anything to get a fix. That's when I saw it. Across the ridge, a figure moving through the trees. Too tall to be human, bulky, its form weirdly misshapen. It saw me too, paused, head tilting bird-like. Hope flared, help even if it was some crazy recluse out this far. But then it turned, loping into the undergrowth with impossible speed, moving in that jerky, inhuman way that set off every alarm bell I had. Knew then that whatever was out there, 
it didn't want to be found. And now, I was being hunted. No more careful trekking, I ran. Heart pounded in my throat, branches slapped at my face. The forest seemed to fight back, roots tripping me, thorns tearing at my skin. The howls got closer, echoing around me now, a horrifying chorus. Stumbled onto another logging road, abandoned but blissfully wide open. I followed it, gasping for breath. Every time I looked back, I caught glimpses of movement just at the edge of the trees, dark shapes flitting like monstrous shadows. By some miracle, the road led me to a ranger station just as the sun dipped below the tree lean. Burst through the door, babbling my story to the startled ranger inside. I was a sight, I know, torn up, bleeding eyes wild. He got me calmed down a little, gave me water called for backup. That's when the other ranger came in, face pale. Said some hikers had found a campsite a few miles back. Shredded tent, gear scattered, blood splatters, and a set of footprints no animal they knew of could have made. That night, huddled by a crackling fire with armed rangers pacing outside, the howls started again. Distant, but I knew, with a bone-deep certainty, they were celebrating. The rangers couldn't hear them, dismissed it as coyotes, but I knew better. The forest had marked me, claimed me as prey, and it wasn't done yet. Search teams combed those woods, found nothing. No bodies, human or otherwise. That mangled campsite was the last trace of anything wrong. Officially, those folks were declared missing, likely victims of an animal attack. But those of us who were there, we know what we heard. It's been years now. I hike local trails, always with a group, but I'll never head into the deep woods alone again. Can't shake the feeling that on starless nights, with the wind in the trees a certain way, those howls might echo in my nightmares. And if I ever catch a shifting glimpse of something just beyond the light, a monstrous shape with eyes that burn like hunger. The year was 1976, and I was young, fit, and maybe a smidge overconfident for a solo hike up Wyoming's Wind River Range. That's where my folks took me camping when I was a kid, you see, so those peaks felt like home. Figured it'd be a nice change of pace from my usual backpacking haunts. Just you out there, huh, Asher? The ranger at the trailhead said with a raised eyebrow as I signed in. I just smiled and shrugged, shouldering my pack. I'd never been one for crowds. Most of the first two days were as peaceful and familiar as I'd hoped. The air was crisp, the trails well-maintained, and the views were breathtaking. That all changed mid-afternoon on the second day, near a high mountain pass. That's the thing about the winds, weather can shift on a dime. A wall of storm clouds rolled in, the kind that makes the very sunlight seem to dim. I found a grove of gnarled, stunted pines that might offer some shelter from the rain. I was setting up my tarp when I heard the laughter. Now, I wasn't startled because I hadn't seen another human since the trailhead. Anyone out here would need shelter too. It was the quality of the sound that made my stomach drop harsh cackling laughter that echoed strangely off the rock faces. I poked my head out from under the tarp. The storm was almost on me, and visibility was dropping, but I could make out a handful of figures scrambling down the steep scree slope towards my little campsite. There were maybe five of them, dressed in ragged clothes that looked out of place in the mountains, even if they were hikers. Their movements were too quick, too jerky for normal people. The laughter was getting louder, and it was starting to make the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. It didn't feel playful, it felt predatory. I didn't wait around to find out their intentions. 
Dropping the tarp, I grabbed my pack and made a dash for the trees. One of the figures saw me move, and a sharp shout went up, followed by the sound of heavy boots pounding across the rocks. The pines weren't much cover, but the terrain was broken with gullies and boulders. I used that to my advantage, zigzagging back and forth, trying to make myself a hard target and hoping the storm would cover my tracks. Every time I thought I'd lost them, a flicker of movement in the distance would send a fresh surge of panic through me. One of them got uncomfortably close. I heard the grunt of effort as he leaped clear across a gully I had to scramble down. I caught a glimpse of his face as he landed sharp, almost feral features beneath a mat of dark, greasy hair. His eyes were wild, darting around, and his teeth were gritted in a rictus of a grin. I stumbled out of a stand of trees, trying to get my bearings. The storm had turned into a downpour, and the world looked like it was viewed through dirty glass. Right in front of me was a sheer drop, leading down into a mist-filled valley. I couldn't go back. Stealing my nerves, I turned away from the edge, trying to pick a safe path down the slope. That's when the hand shot out from the brush, grabbing my boot. I lost my balance and fell, rolling down the wet, unforgiving rock. There was pain everywhere, in my knees, my ribs, but I scrambled to my feet anyway. Just below me, one of the figures was detaching itself from the shadows. Then another and another. I realized two things in that moment. They were circling me, and I was badly outnumbered. What do you want? I shouted into the rain, hating how my voice shook. It got the reaction I was hoping for. They froze. They still didn't speak, and the eerie laughter was gone, replaced by an intense silence. Then, slowly, almost reluctantly, they started to back off. What little I could see of their faces was wrinkled in confusion, like the very question offended them. Taking advantage of their hesitation, I hobbled away as quickly as I could, back up the slope and into the storm-shrouded trees. When I was sure they weren't following, I risked a glance back. I couldn't see them, but I knew they were there, watching. The storm raged for two more days. I hunkered down, injured and terrified, trying to ration my supplies as best I could. The whole time, I had the feeling I was being watched, like there were hungry eyes just beyond the edge of my vision. On the third day, the rain finally let up. I knew I couldn't stay there. Weak as I was, I packed up my battered gear and limped onward, following what I hoped was the route back towards the trailhead. I didn't see any sign of my pursuers, but I also didn't see another living soul until I reached the ranger's station. I told them, well, I'm not even sure what I told them. A garbled story about getting lost in the storm and injuring myself. When they offered to help me find my campsite so I could collect my gear, I said it wasn't important, just glad to be back safe and sound. The rangers exchanged a look I didn't like, but they didn't press it. I never went back to the winds. Whatever was out there, I want nothing to do with it. I've spent a lot of time wondering just what I stumbled into that day. Crazy survivalists? A feral group cut off from society? Or maybe something else, something the old stories warned about, the things they said lurked in the wild places. I don't know, and I'm honestly not sure I want to. This happened to me on June 24th, 1993. My name is Wyatt Reed, and I've been with the police force in Ironwood, Wisconsin, for nearly 10 years now. Most of the time, life here is peaceful. Ironwood is nestled in a scenic part of the state, surrounded by the woods and lakes bordering Michigan. 
The type of place where folks leave the keys in their cars and rarely lock their doors at night. I like it. I like the sense of community and the slow pace of life. It's a good place to raise a family. Anyways, this night started like any other, at least until I saw that minivan. It was an old, beat-up thing, covered in rust and missing a hubcap. It was parked at the end of a dirt road, a long, dark trail cutting into the dense pine forest that flanked the highway. The headlights were on, although nobody was sitting in the driver's seat. Even out here, a vehicle parked all alone seemed a little odd. I decided it wouldn't hurt to check it out. My gut was telling me something wasn't quite right. Leaving my cruiser by the highway, I pulled my flashlight out and approached the minivan. The interior was deserted, the windows rolled halfway down. That's when I noticed the splashes of blood on the dashboard and across the front seats. My instincts kicked in. I called for backup, even as I cautiously opened the back doors of the van. That's when I saw the bodies. Two women were crammed against the back wall, their clothes ragged and stained with blood. Their eyes stared blankly into the darkness. I cursed. I tried to check for a pulse, but it was pointless. They were long gone. The blood was already dried and dark. I quickly stepped back out of the van, trying not to disturb anything. I radioed in the situation, my voice tense. Backup was a good ten minutes away. The isolation I usually crave suddenly felt stifling, suffocating. I heard a rustle in the woods and spun around, my flashlight cutting through the gloom. At first I thought it might be a deer, but this movement was different, more deliberate. My hand went to my service weapon. Come out, whoever's there. My voice sounded shaky, no matter how much I tried to steady it. The rustling grew louder, closer. My palms felt sweaty. It was circling around me, whatever it was. I caught a flash of movement from the corner of my eye. It was massive, at least seven feet tall, hunched slightly on long, powerful legs. Its body was emaciated, but its arms were impossibly thick, ending in gnarled claws. Its eyes glowed a bright amber in the light of my flashlight, and when it opened its mouth I saw rows of jagged, blood-stained teeth. Sweet Mary, I breathed as my mind finally gave a name to this nightmare. It was a Wendigo, a creature from the old legends, a spirit of hunger and starvation. The realization hit me like a physical blow. I took a step back, stumbling slightly. Before I could get my wits together, it charged. I got off two shots, but the bullets passed through it like it was made of mist. I barely had time to jump to the side as it swiped at me, those claws raking the side of the minivan and sparking against the metal. It lunged again, and I stumbled, hitting the ground hard. I frantically rolled to the side, hearing the whoosh of air as it tried to snatch me. I scrambled onto my feet, gasping for breath. I ran for the cruiser, for the safety of the highway and the possibility of backup. But even as I sprinted, I knew deep down that it would be no escape. It would follow, it would always follow. The knowledge filled me with dread, with an almost primal despair. My boots pounded against the dirt, my breath came in ragged gasps. The woods pressed in on either side, dark and unforgiving. I risked a glance back and saw it, effortlessly gaining ground. My cruiser was still a good distance away. I stumbled, fell to my knees, my vision blurring. Panic pounded in my chest like a second heartbeat. Why hadn't backup arrived? I tried to stand, to keep running, but my legs felt like lead. And then it was there looming over me. I scrambled backwards, away from those claws, those teeth, those glowing eyes. I felt a surge of defiance, 
and reached for my gun one last time. The creature descended on me with a blood-curdling screech. The flashlight fell from my hand, plunging the scene into absolute darkness. I braced for the teeth to rip into me, for the pain that was surely coming. The Wendigo's screech echoed in my ears. I squeezed my eyes shut, waiting for the end to find me there in the dirt. A searing pain pierced my shoulder. It must have sunk its claws into me. I screamed, thrashing wildly against its grip. Then I heard the gunshots. Loud, sharp cracks against the relative silence of the night. The creature howled, an inhuman sound of pain and rage. I felt its grip loosened and fell to the ground, gasping and choking for air. My ears rang, but somewhere in the distance, I heard the siren of approaching backup. The Wendigo stumbled backward, clutching at its side. I could see dark liquid staining its fur in the flashing red and blue lights. Wyatt? Wyatt, answer me, damn it! That was Sergeant Peterson's voice, rough, filled with panic. I tried to call out, but nothing came out except a hoarse croak. My flashlight lay a few feet away, still beaming. I fumbled for it, my trembling hands almost failing me. When I finally gripped the handle, I aimed it straight at the creature. The backup had arrived. Peterson and two other deputies had their guns drawn, flooding the scene with their own flashlights. The Wendigo was backed against a tree, its amber eyes fixed on the officers. For one horrifying moment, it seemed to consider attacking them, despite being injured, despite being outnumbered. And then... With an ear-splitting shriek, it turned and vanished into the darkness. Peterson rushed toward me, his face etched with worry. Wyatt, you all right, son? He grabbed my arms, scanning me frantically for injuries. I managed a weak nod, still struggling to catch my breath. My shoulder was burning white-hot with pain. I looked down and saw that my uniform was soaked with blood. Ambulance is on the way, Peterson said, his gaze never leaving mine. Hang in there, Wyatt. Then the world faded into a haze. Sirens wailed, voices surrounded me, and then, mercifully, darkness claimed me. I woke up in the hospital, my shoulder bandaged, my head still spinning. Peterson was sitting beside the bed, an unreadable expression on his face. You were lucky, Wyatt, he said, his voice gruff. That thing could have torn you to shreds. I tried to speak, but my throat was raw. Peterson handed me a glass of water, which I gratefully gulped down. The women, I finally rasped out. We couldn't find them, Peterson said grimly. A wave of nausea washed over me. Gone, vanished into the night devoured by some insatiable monster. The doctors kept me in the hospital for two weeks. They stitched up the ragged wounds on my shoulder, gave me antibiotics and painkillers, and monitored me for signs of infection, both physical and otherworldly. But I never got sick. Not like the legends say you do after encountering a Wendigo. Maybe the bullets had weakened it, or maybe I simply got lucky. When I was released from the hospital, my whole world felt off-kilter. The normalcy of my life was shattered. I couldn't shake the image of those lifeless eyes in the minivan, or the creature's amber stare fixed on me moments before the attack. The nightmares became a constant companion, stealing my sleep and replacing it with relentless fear. The town didn't know what to make of it. Officially, the incident was reported as an animal attack. Most folks accepted this. A bear or a mountain lion, maybe. Those who knew me, or knew about the legends, they gave me sympathetic looks. But even they struggled to truly believe. Peterson, bless him, kept my secret. He knew a cover-up was necessary, for public safety and, frankly, 
for my own sanity. The attack stopped. The creature, whether wounded or simply frightened off, retreated back into the shadows. Life in Ironwood slowly returned to its quiet pace. The keys found their way back into the cars, and the doors were once again left unlocked at night. But I couldn't forget. I carried the weight of what happened like a stone in my gut. It changed me, made me hypervigilant, distrustful of shadows and the quiet sounds of the night, made me buy heavy-duty blackout curtains from my bedroom windows. I went back to work, did my job, but my heart wasn't in it anymore. The thrill of police work, of protecting my community, was soured by that night in the woods. A year later, I walked into Peterson's office and handed him my resignation letter. He didn't try to talk me out of it, he just clapped me on the shoulder and wished me well. I packed my things into my car and drove away from Ironwood without a backward glance. I moved down south, to a bustling city where I could lose myself in noise and crowds. Took a job as a security guard in a big apartment complex. The nights are still the hardest. When the wind howls outside my window, or a floorboard creaks in the hallway, I reach for the hunting rifle I keep hidden under my bed. Just in case. Truth is, no matter how far I run, or how much time passes, I know that the Wendigo is still out there. It's a part of me now, a shadow that clings to my soul. Some scars you can't see but they run deeper than any wound inflicted by claws or teeth. I don't know if I'll ever find peace, but I keep searching. And I keep waiting for the day when those glowing amber eyes find me again. This happened to me on July 22, 1999. I was fixing up my family's old summer cabin up by Lake Superior in Minnesota. Woods all around, and those were my woods. I knew every trail by heart. Names Everett. That summer, something felt off. Like the forest was, watching. The birds weren't singing much, the usual critters rustling around seemed quieter. But I shrugged it off figuring it was just me getting old and paranoid. A couple of days later, I was taking a break from sanding the porch, having a smoke out back. There's a little stream nearby, and that's when I saw it, footprints by the water. But they weren't human. These prints were bigger than my whole hand, and the toes were all wrong, long and splayed out wrong. My stomach dropped a little lower when I noticed the claw marks in the soft mud. Whatever made those tracks wasn't a bear or a wolf, nothing I'd ever seen around here. I crept closer, the old hunting instincts kicking in despite the growing dread in my gut. It looked like there had been a struggle. Blood, bits of fur tangled in the leaves. Something was hurt, maybe dying. Part of me, some primal part, wanted to keep following the blood trail, but the sensible part, the part that valued not becoming something's dinner, won out. I went back to the cabin and loaded my shotgun, something I hadn't bothered with in years. That night, I bolted all the windows and slept with the gun next to the bed. I didn't see anything, didn't hear anything unusual, which honestly made it all more terrifying. A few days later, I figured it was safe to head into town for supplies. The local diner was usually where folks shared gossip, so maybe someone would know if anything odd had been going on. I grabbed my keys and headed for the truck. That's when I found them. Bones. Scattered in my yard. Big bones, but smaller than a deer's, picked clean. Then I saw the blood splatters on the porch the drag marks in the dust by the steps, and I realized whatever left those footprints had been outside my cabin last night. Suddenly, I didn't want to go into town anymore. 
didn't want to leave the safety of the cabin. But I was running low on supplies, and I had to tell someone. As I turned back towards the cabin, I saw a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. Something was watching from the trees. Then it stepped into the light. My mind struggled to process it. This thing, it was massive, at least seven feet tall, maybe more. Covered in a thick, shaggy dark fur, its posture was hunched, but in a way that reminded me both of an ape and a bear. Head was big, almost dog-like, with a long muzzle full of sharp teeth. And the eyes, I'll never forget those eyes. Pure red, glowing with a predatory intelligence that made my blood freeze. I fumbled for the shotgun in the back of the truck, cursing silently at myself for never putting it inside the cabin. Before I could level the gun, it snarled, a deep, guttural thing that sent tremors through my chest, and charged. I fired one shot in its direction, more of a reflexive shot of panic than anything aimed. The creature swerved, disappearing into the thick trees with impossible speed for something its size. I threw myself inside the truck, doors locked, hands shaking so hard I could barely start the engine. In the rearview mirror, as I tore out of the driveway, I thought I saw a dark shape watching from the tree line, but it may have been my fear-addled imagination playing tricks. At the diner, the locals seemed amused that old Everett had seen a bear or something. I debated telling the truth, but those red eyes flashed through my mind, the sheer power and malice in that stare. Nobody would believe me. They'd think I was going crazy in my old age. I made some excuse about feeling sick and headed home, stopping to buy every type of lock I could find at the hardware store. Back at the cabin, I barricaded myself in, boarding up some of the windows, and setting trip wires around the perimeter made from tin cans and string. I didn't dare sleep. Every crack in the wood, every rustle of the wind, sent me clutching the shotgun and flinching at shadows. It was a long night. The next morning, I had to face the truth. I couldn't stay here. Whatever that thing was, it knew where I lived. Even if I got a message out to someone— some ranger, maybe. Help wouldn't arrive in time. I stashed my most important stuff in the truck. That's when I heard it, the sound of something moving through the trees near the stream. I grabbed the shotgun, creeping towards a window. Peering out, I saw a flash of dark fur, and those red eyes staring back at me. It knew I was leaving, it knew, and it wasn't done with me yet. I fired out the window, shattering the glass. A roar of anger echoed through the woods. I threw the truck into gear and tore out of there, tires spitting gravel behind me. Glancing in the mirror, I saw a hulking shape charging from the trees, gaining on me. I slammed my foot on the accelerator, the old truck protesting but surging forward. The dirt road blurred. The tree branches whipped past in my peripheral vision, but all I could see in my mind were those red eyes and the snarl of rage echoing behind me. It was gaining. No matter how much I pushed the engine, the creature in the rearview mirror seemed to be crawling closer. It was faster than anything I'd ever seen, matching the truck's jarring pace despite the rough terrain. I reached the main highway, but I didn't slow down. Something told me it wouldn't risk exposure. It was a creature of the woods, of the shadows. But I didn't want to find out if I was wrong. Mile after mile I drove, heart pounding like a war drum. Finally, I saw the lights of another town, a bigger one this time, and I risked slowing down. Gasping for breath, hands trembling from the adrenaline, I made it to the first gas station I saw. I was covered in sweat, my old hunting clothes torn and muddy. I must have looked like a man-man barging into the station. The cashier, a young kid, stared at me wide-eyed. Peep, Elise, I gasped out.
call. Call 911. Then I fumbled for my landline card, remembering I was out of range of regular cell service way back in the woods. A few incoherent minutes later, local cops arrived. I told my story, and they gave me the long, patient look usually reserved for the town drunk. But something in my eyes, that raw, bone-deep terror, made them hesitate. A ranger arrived, too. He listened, expression skeptical but something flickering in his eyes. I pointed on a map, pinpointing my cabin's location. You won't find it. I warn. Whatever it is, it's not stupid. It'll have dragged evidence back into the woods. The ranger nodded. Old legends around here, he said quietly, so the other officers couldn't hear. Stories from way back. Things most folks stop believing in. But there's always that edge to the wild, they ain't there? Where only the old tales live. They insisted on driving me back to that dirt road, the entrance to my woods. I wouldn't get out of the police cruiser, even when they saw the shredded remnants of my trip wires and the blood stains on the porch. It was enough. Even for the skeptics, it was enough to see the look on my face and know I wasn't lying. The ranger took over from there. Whatever he reported to his superiors, it was enough to get them to shut down that stretch of woods. Officially, it was bare sightings, maybe a rabid animal, enough to scare off tourists and hikers for a good long while. I never went back, of course. Sold the land the first chance I got, and took the money and ran. I moved south, a rented apartment in a big, crowded city where the closest thing to wildlife is a pigeon. The nightmares faded eventually, that relentless feeling of being hunted. Sometimes I still see the flicker of red in the headlights of passing cars, or the massive, dark shape hulking in the shadows of an alley, and my breath catches. People ask what happened out there. What did I see? I give a vague answer. Animal attack, wild dog, whatever makes sense to them. Truth is, I don't know for sure what that creature was. Sometimes I look up old Native American lore about the area, the legends the ranger hinted at. Skinwalkers, monstrous trickster spirits, they fit, in a terrifying way, but don't offer any real answers. And then there's the other thought the one that creeps in some nights when the city noise can't quite drown out my racing pulse. Maybe there isn't an answer. Maybe it wasn't any legend come to life, but something else. Something that's always been out there in the dark fringes of the forest, preying on the unlucky, on those foolish enough to venture out alone. Something that got a taste for me, and is just biding its time waiting for when I foolishly believe myself safe. I try not to dwell on that thought too much. It's been over twenty years. I figure if it was going to find me, it would have by now. Cities have their own dangers, sure, but nothing with glowing red eyes and a roar that can split the quiet of a summer night. I sleep with the lights on, and my windows have pretty heavy-duty blinds. Just a precaution, of course. But every now and then, when the wind howls in a way that's just a touch too wild for the city, I pull the blinds down a little tighter, and I listen. And sometimes I think, just maybe, I hear an echo of a footstep outside, heavy and wrong, and a low, rumbling growl fading into the distance. My name is Jason Cole, and this happened to me in September 2016. I'm the type most folks assume has a 9-to-5 office job and a mortgage. You wouldn't look at me and think I've seen the things I have. But I'm not the desk jockey type. I'm part of a team they keep in the shadows. The kind they call when the regular channels fail, when things go bump in the night, and no one else has the answers. 
We were called into Yellowstone National Park that summer. Series of bizarre animal deaths was the official explanation. Mutilated elk carcasses, drained of blood, no predator tracks in sight. Locals whispered about vampires, chupacabras, whatever horror their imaginations could conjure. My three-man crew knew the official explanation was always a smokescreen. Our team was me, the tracker, ex-military. Then there was Davis, tech guy. Glasses, wiry frame, genius in the lab. And Brooks, our leader. A man who, once you stripped away the crisp uniform, had eyes that had stared into the abyss way too many times. We got the full debrief at the local ranger station. Park officials were on edge. Yellowstone is their baby, and they hated admitting something was happening they couldn't explain. We didn't blame them. The truth we hunted? It wasn't the stuff of campfire stories. It was the stuff of nightmares. The first few days were routine. We swept suspected kill sites, collected samples, set cameras. Then everything changed. It began with a radio call, a panicked park ranger on the other end. I have eyes on it. Sector 3, near Old Faithful. It's... Christ, I don't know what it is. Requesting immediate backup. Davis swore, already scrambling for his gear. I felt a rush of adrenaline and a knot of dread twisting in my gut. This was it. This was what we had come for. We piled into the jeep, Davis navigating. He pinpointed the ranger's coordinates, and we tore off down a dirt track. When we arrived at the scene, I'll admit my nerves were jangling tight enough to snap. Ranger Thompson was there, crouched behind his truck, pale as a ghost. Over there, he hissed, pointing a trembling finger towards the tree line. At first, all I saw were dark shadows. Then, a shape coalesced out of the gloom. Massive, at least eight feet tall at the shoulder, crouched like a predatory cat. As it stepped into the waning sunlight, I got a full view. Thick, matted fur, dark as midnight. A muzzle stretched too long, too many teeth flashing inside. Its limbs moved with an inhuman, sinuous power, like muscle and bone were molded from liquid. My training kicked in, years of facing the unknown distilling into a single moment of clarity. Get Thompson out of here, Brooks barked to me. He and Davis already had their rifles up. The creature was advancing now. Not a mindless animal, but a predator with intelligence blazing in its eyes. Then, as if sensing their intentions, it turned and bolted back into the trees with blinding speed. Go! 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 Brooks roared. We chased that thing for hours. Davis tracked it on thermal, but it moved like a wraith always one step ahead. Trails led us in circles, thermal signatures vanished and reappeared in impossible locations. It was playing with us, toying with its prey. The light was failing as we stumbled into a clearing and found our quarry waiting. Moonlight glittered on its fangs, reflecting in a dozen gleaming eyes scattered across its hide. Its mouth opened in a twisted mockery of a grin. Brooks raised his rifle. Davis fumbled with a grenade launcher, muttering prayers under his breath. It's changing, I croaked, the words snagging in my throat. The creature's form rippled, bones shifting beneath the thick fur. It quadrupled in size, sprouting extra limbs that sprouted its own eyes. A low growl, less animal than machine, vibrated through the clearing and then it charged. The air filled with the roar of gunfire and explosions. Something huge and heavy bowled me over, knocking the breath from my lungs. I tasted blood. I scrambled for a weapon, for anything. Then nothing. Blackness. I woke up hours later, 
head throbbing. Brooks knelt beside me, his face etched with grim relief. Not far off, I saw Davis, his arm in a makeshift sling. The grenade, Brooks said, knocked it back, gave us time to retreat. Then his voice hardened. But it's still out there. We never got a clear shot. We tracked it for days, always a few steps behind. Finally, the order came from above, extraction. They were pulling us out. We left Yellowstone with the beast still roaming its forests, and the image of those eyes, too many eyes, burned into my mind. My name is Ezekiel Barnes, and this happened to me in the spring of 2008. Back then, I was just a greenhorn fresh out of the military, looking to put my skills towards something interesting. That's how I landed a job with a covert government outfit I can't name. Let's just say they deal with things most people think are campfire stories. You wouldn't guess by looking at me that I've seen the things I have. I'm the kind of guy who blends in jeans and a t-shirt, a ball cap pulled low. Folks think I'm a mechanic or maybe a landscaper. And yeah, I know my way around an engine, but what I really fix are problems of a much hairier nature. The job that sent me to the Olympic Peninsula was a mess from the get-go. Sightings of something huge and bipedal had been popping up around a small logging town in Washington State. The locals were spooked, and with every passing night, the reports grew more gruesome. Missing livestock, shredded campsites, finally, a missing hiker just torn chunks of clothing and blood left behind. My team was tiny, me, Anya, team leader and cryptozoology expert, and Davis, tech specialist and weapons guy if things got ugly. We set up camp discreetly a few miles outside of town trying to get a feel for the lay of the land. The Olympic Peninsula is old-growth rainforest, the kind of place where a man can vanish without a trace. A few nights in, we got our first taste of what we were up against. Anya had rigged the perimeter with motion-sensing cameras and thermal imaging. I was on watch in the camper when the alert tripped. Grainy footage flickered onto the screen, a massive, hulking shape, moving through the trees with impossible speed. There was nothing definitive, just a suggestion of claws and a heavy, loping gait. Whatever it was, it was big, and it was close. The next morning, Davis and I headed into the woods, following a hunch more than any hard evidence. The air was thick with the smell of pine and damp earth. After what felt like hours of navigating the dense undergrowth, we reached a ravine, and that's when we found the remains of the missing hiker. Let me just say, I'd seen combat. I'd seen things that would make most men throw up or crack under the strain. But this, it was different. This was pure, primal savagery. The body was, it wasn't just torn apart, it was dismembered with impossible strength. Bones were crushed to splinters. It wasn't the work of anything I'd ever seen in a zoo or a textbook. Back at camp, Anya's face was grim. Davis just paced, a nervous energy buzzing under his quiet demeanor. We all knew what we weren't saying. We were outmatched. This wasn't a bear gone rogue, not a mountain lion strayed too far from its territory. This was something new, something monstrous. The decision came fast. Anya radioed for backup, but it would take days to arrive. Meanwhile, this thing was out there, hunting. We had to do something. That night we went back to the ravine. Anya brought a tranquilizer rifle, the kind used to take down elephants. Not ideal, but it was the biggest gun we had. Davis set up a perimeter with night vision scopes. The plan was simple and almost certainly suicidal. Lure the creature in, 
hit it with enough trank to knock out a rhino, and hope for the best. We didn't have long to wait. The forest went silent, the hush that falls right before the predator strikes. A low, guttural growl echoed through the darkness. He stepped into the clearing, a massive, towering figure. He moved on two legs like a man, but his body was covered in thick, dark fur. His eyes glowed yellow in the darkness, filled with cunning and rage. Moonlight glinted off long, curved claws. He knew we were there. Anya raised the rifle, but the creature charged. It was unbelievably fast, covering the distance in seconds. Davis opened fire, more to buy us time than actually stop the beast. I was scrambling back pure adrenaline making my heart pound in my ears. Anya stumbled, her foot catching on a root. The creature was upon her in a flash, the rifle knocked from her grasp. She screamed, and then Davis was there. He wasn't a big guy, but the look on his face was pure fury. He lunged at the creature, not with a gun, but with a machete he kept strapped to his gear. The blade caught moonlight as he swung, striking the creature's shoulder. The creature roared, more surprised than injured. It swiped a massive paw at Davis, sending him flying like a ragdoll. He slammed into a tree and crumpled to the ground. I thought he was dead. In that moment, a cold rage ignited within me. Anya was down, Davis most likely too. It was down to me. I fumbled for my sidearm, more out of desperation than any real belief a pistol would slow that thing down. The creature rounded on me, its eyes burning with bloodlust. And that's when I saw it. The wound on its shoulder, a deep gash from Davis's machete. It gleamed with a strange, pale liquid in the moonlight, not blood. I fired twice, aiming for the center of its chest. The bullets made it grunt, more in annoyance than pain. But it hesitated, its gaze flicking back to the wound. And in that moment of hesitation, an idea sparked, a desperate, crazy plan. I turned and ran. The creature let loose a furious bellow and charged after me. Blindly, I sprinted deeper into the forest, branches tearing at my face, my mind racing. My only hope lay in one of the supply crates we had stashed back at camp, a bottle of experimental compound Anya had brought, a prototype bioweapon in case of absolute last resort. The creature was gaining on me, its heavy footfalls shaking the ground. I could hear its ragged breath, smell its rank, fed its stench. I burst into the clearing of our campsite, the camper looming ahead. Ripping open a supply crate, I fumbled for the vial of milky white liquid. It was designed to trigger a hyper-aggressive immune response in anything it came in contact with basically, make the target's body attack itself. If it worked even half as well as Anya hoped, it might be enough to take that thing down. The creature crashed into the clearing behind me. I turned, raised the vial, and hurled it like a grenade. It shattered against its chest, the viscous liquid splattering its fur. The reaction was immediate. It staggered, let loose a howl that was part pain, part fury. Its skin blistered and bubbled where the liquid touched. It thrashed, clawing at its own chest, as if trying to tear the burning poison from its body. I used its distraction to scramble into the camper, slamming the door shut behind me. I heard the creature battering the metal hull, its roars echoing through the small space. For hours, the assault continued. Through the windows, I watched its movements grow sluggish, its fury replaced by a growing disorientation. As dawn broke, the noises finally ceased. When I dared to venture outside, the creature was gone. I followed a trail of devastation, trees uprooted the ground churned to mud. It ended abruptly at the edge of the ravine. 
There were no further tracks, no body, nothing to indicate which way it had fled. Days later, backup arrived. Anya had broken ribs, but was alive. Davis, he wasn't so lucky. They choppered us out. The whole area declared off-limits under the guise of an environmental hazard. The creature was never found. The official report blamed everything on a bear attack, another hiker's death explained away by the harsh wilderness. And me? I didn't walk away from that job, not exactly. But I did learn a few hard truths. There are things out there that defy explanation— Predators that walk on two legs but aren't human. The government knows, they always do, but they'd rather keep the world in the dark. Trust me, the campfire stories you tell to scare kids? Those aren't the ones you should be afraid of. Life hasn't been the same since. I quit the team, drifted from one odd job to the next. I sleep with a loaded gun under my pillow and jump at every creaking floorboard. Some nights, I see Davis's face, the way he looked lunging at that monster with nothing but a machete and a whole lot of courage. More often, I see the creature, those glowing eyes, the claws that could tear a man in half. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I disagree. Sometimes, it just leaves you broken, forever haunted by the things that lurk in the shadows, and the knowledge that no one will ever believe you. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in 2009. I drive a long-haul rig crisscrossing this country more times than I can count. It's lonely work, for sure, but you see some amazing things, especially after the sun goes down. I share the road with a whole different crowd at night. This particular route had been a milk run for a while. Florida oranges up to New England, then an empty trailer back down. Easy peasy, though the pay wasn't great. But hey, at least it kept the wheels turning. That August, I was hauling through the Ozarks, deep in southwest Missouri. Mountain roads, all twists and blind curves, not my favorite, especially in darkness. But it was late, and I was pushing to hit my deadline. I was nearly nodding off when I saw the hitchhiker just off the shoulder. A woman, hunched over, arms wrapped around herself like she was freezing. Now, I don't usually pick up strangers, but there was something about her that nod at me. Maybe it was how out of place she seemed, on that lonely stretch of road in the middle of nowhere. I slowed down, debating. Common sense said to keep driving. But then again, what if she was in real trouble? Might be worth the risk. I pulled over, flipped on the hazards. She approached my truck, and I got my first good look at her. She was older than I'd first thought, maybe late thirties. Her face was gaunt, eyes ringed with dark circles. Thank God, she rasped, her voice barely a whisper. Ride broke down on me miles back. Now, this seemed a little off, but it was late and I was tired. Didn't have the energy to argue. Get in, I said, unlocking the passenger door. She settled into the seat with a shivering sigh. You're a lifesaver. I was starting to think I'd be spending the night out here. Where you headed? I asked, pulling back onto the highway. Branson, she replied, voice stronger now. Got family there. She didn't elaborate. I didn't ask for details. Honestly, I was half asleep and just wanted to get to the next truck stop. Conversation drifted for a while. Mostly small talk, harmless stuff. But the longer she sat there, the more uneasy I felt. She wasn't giving off any bad vibes, just something was off. I couldn't place my finger on it. Glancing in the passenger mirror, I noticed something. 
Her clothes were caked in dirt and leaves, like she'd been scrambling through the woods, but I hadn't seen any car nearby. Strange. I decided to make my move. Listen, I got a level with you, no cell reception out here. I got no way to help if you really did have a breakdown. Her shoulders tensed. I... I know. I can walk it from here once the sun's up. My gut twisted. This whole situation was getting weirder by the minute, and I didn't like it. Actually, there's a town ahead. Motel, maybe a diner. We can get you set up there. No, please, she replied, her voice tight. I need to get to Branson. Look, I said, keeping my tone steady. We'll get you there eventually, but I gotta get some rest. It ain't safe driving like this. Her eyes darted to the side window, then back to me. Something like panic flashed across her face. I... I understand, she finally mumbled. Good, I thought. We were making progress. I found an exit a few miles ahead and pulled off the highway. The motel was just a sad-looking place with flickering neon lights. But it would do for a few hours. I gave her some cash from my wallet. Enough for a room and a bus ticket come morning. This should see you through till you can catch that ride to Branson. She took the money, mumbled a thanks, and bolted from the truck. I watched her disappear into the motel office. My mind was still buzzing, unable to shake that strange feeling she left me with. Before I could hit the bunk, a noise made me freeze. It was a muffled scream, coming from the motel. And it sounded a lot like my passenger. I jumped out of the truck and ran toward the motel. The door to her room hung half open. I burst in expecting. I don't know what. Maybe an attacker, someone holding her against her will. But the room was empty. No sign of a struggle, no sign of her. The window behind the ratty curtain stood wide open. A wave of confusion washed over me. Had she made a run for it? Why? The more I thought about it, the less sense it made. She'd begged for a ride, desperate for help, yet here she was, sneaking off into the night. Something brushed against my leg. I jumped, then realized it was just a faded motel brochure that must have blown across the floor. It was one of those cheesy tourist things, advertising local attractions. I scanned it absently caves, fishing holes, civil war battlefields, the usual fare for these rural areas. That's when my eyes snagged on a headline. Beware the mountain man. My heart skipped a beat. The article was short just a few paragraphs warning about a string of unsolved disappearances in the area. Locals whispered of a wild man, living in the woods, preying on unsuspecting travelers. Hikers, drifters, folks who wouldn't be missed. My blood ran cold. I remembered the dirt caked on her clothes, the fear in her eyes when I mentioned driving into town. Was the story about the woman just a cover? A way to get into my truck, lull me into a false sense of security? And then it hit me. I was her next target. Panic surged through me. I had to get out of there. But where to go? The open road, dark and lonely, suddenly seemed just as dangerous as that motel room. That's when I spotted the phone booth just outside the office. Could I get a signal? Maybe call the police though I wasn't sure what I'd even tell them. I was halfway to the phone when headlights pierced the darkness. A beat-up pickup truck swerved into the motel parking lot and careened to a stop. My breath caught in my throat. The driver's side door swung open. A monstrous figure emerged, built like a linebacker gone to seed. He had a wild, unkempt beard that reached his chest, and his eyes gleamed with a feral intensity beneath a battered camouflage hat. 
my fear spiked. This was him, the mountain man from the brochure. He spotted me and grinned. It wasn't a friendly grin, more like a predator baring its teeth. Well, what do you know? Looks like dinner delivered itself tonight, he growled, moving towards me with surprising speed for a guy his size. I turned and ran, instincts taking over. The phone booth seemed ages away. My only hope was getting back to my truck, locking myself inside, and praying he couldn't break in. Behind me, I heard his heavy footsteps and foul-smelling breath. He was gaining, closing in fast. I was a few feet from the truck when my foot caught on something in the gravel, sending me sprawling to the ground. The force of the fall knocked the wind out of me. I struggled to get back up, but the pain in my ankle was searing. The mountain man was upon me. His meaty hand clamped down on my shoulder, dragging me across the rough pavement. I kicked out wildly, desperate to get free. With a roar, he hauled me up and slammed me against the side of my truck. The impact rattled my teeth. I saw stars, my vision blurred. His hot breath reeked of something rotten. Thought you could get away, did ya? He raised a heavy fist, and I instinctively threw up an arm to shield myself. The blow crashed against my forearm with sickening force. I cried out as something snapped. That was when the police lights flashed across the parking lot. The mountain man froze. I didn't know how anyone found us out here in the middle of nowhere, but I wasn't about to complain. With a frustrated bellow, the mountain man released me and bolted towards the tree lean at the edge of the lot. Two officers sprinted after him, guns drawn. I heard a shout, a single gunshot, then silence. I slumped to the ground, clutching my broken arm, shaking uncontrollability. Everything had happened so fast, too fast to fully comprehend. It felt like a nightmare. The next few days were a blur of pain, police interviews, the long drive home with a cast on my arm and a deep, gnawing fear that would take a lot longer to heal. News reports filled in the blanks. It turned out the woman I'd picked up was named Eliza, and she was his accomplice. Her role was to lure unsuspecting victims to him. They'd been a team for years, preying on those who wouldn't be missed immediately, leaving nothing but fading wanted posters and unsolved cases behind. They told me I was lucky. The mountain man had a history of violence, torture even. Most of his victims were never found. The ones who were, well, the officers said it wasn't a pretty sight. The officer who fired that shot in the parking lot, he saved my life. But the story didn't end there, not really. The police found Eliza a week later, hiding out in a cabin deep in the woods. Turns out she didn't run when I went into the motel room she was waiting, ready to ambush me from behind. The mountain man is still out there, somewhere in those vast Ozark hills. They said they're confident they'll get him eventually, but until then, they advised me not to travel alone through remote areas. I don't think I'll need any convincing on that point. Sometimes, when that old diesel engine drones on and on under the night sky, I remember that woman's haunted eyes, that hulking figure in the darkness, and that gunshot ringing out and I realized how close I came to being just another ghost story whispered along the lonely highways. My name is Wes, and this happened to me in the fall of 2006. I'd been driving trucks since I left the military long hauls mainly, a mix of loneliness and a kind of mechanical freedom that suited me just fine. I had a wife in those years, Sarah, and we were hoping to start a family. The miles ate up my nights, but the paychecks bought us a little house in the suburbs, the promise of normalcy. 
I told myself it was worth it. I usually ran between the Midwest and the East Coast. This time, though, my route would take me down south, a load of textiles bound for a factory near Savannah. Weather was warm for October, the air thick with the last dregs of summer. I didn't mind the heat. Better than the icy blasts of a northern winter, any day. The first night on the road, I pulled into a truck stop somewhere in Tennessee. It was one of those independent places, not part of a big chain, run down and a little grimy but with decent food. I parked my Volvo rig in the massive lot filled with the hulking shapes of semis, grabbed my bag, and headed for the diner. Inside, it was the usual mix of road-weary drivers, grease-stained overalls, and weary waitresses dishing out coffee refills. I grabbed a stool at the empty counter and ordered a double cheeseburger. As I waited for my food, I noticed a figure out of the corner of my eye. At first, I assumed it was just another trucker, but something in the man's stillness, the way he held himself, made me take a closer look. He wasn't young, probably in his early sixties, I guessed. He had a weathered face with deeply etched lines, a thick head of salt and pepper hair, and the kind of faded denim jacket too worn to have been bought in recent memory. Yet, his eyes were startlingly vivid, a bright, icy blue that seemed strangely out of place on his aged face. He sat hunched over a coffee, nursing the mug, but not drinking from it. And he was staring at me, not in a threatening way, but with an intensity that made my skin crawl. I looked away, busying myself with unfolding the crumpled napkin on the counter. But I could feel those eyes boring into me, an unnerving prickling sensation on the back of my neck. I fidgeted, my burger suddenly losing its appeal. Who was this guy? Maybe just some old drifter passing through, hitching rides from truck to truck but something about the relentless intensity of his stare was off-putting. I finished my food quickly, paid the cashier, and all but ran back out to my truck. The parking lot lights cast long, distorted shadows. I scanned the lot, some primal instinct screaming at me to look for that solitary figure in the faded denim jacket and those unblinking eyes. He was nowhere to be seen, Relief flooded through me, mingled with a jolt of self-mockery for being spooked by some old loner. I shrugged off the unease, climbed into my cab, and pulled out of the lot, merging into the relentless flow of the interstate. Yet, the image of his relentless stare lingered. That night, when I finally pulled over to catch a few hours of sleep, I double-checked that my doors were locked the sense of vulnerability sharp and unsettling. In the morning, the light of day washed away the previous night's jitters. I passed it off as one of those random encounters that stick in your mind for reasons you can't fully explain. But then he reappeared. About two days later, at a rest stop along I-75. I couldn't believe it at first. The feeling was like some sort of waking nightmare deja vu. There he was, leaning against a battered pickup truck in the far corner of the lot, those distinctive blue eyes watching my every move. Panic flared inside me, sharp as a fire alarm. Now, it was more than coincidence. This guy was following me. Questions hammered in my head. Why? Was he connected to the company? Some rival driver, trying to play mind games? He didn't look the part. Maybe he was one of those creeps preying on truckers. I didn't want to find out. I got back in my truck and took off, my heart pounding a desperate rhythm. There was a phone booth at the rest stop entrance, but the idea of stopping felt like inviting disaster. The cell phone reception out here was spotty at best. I drove for hours, fear and adrenaline fueling my speed. I tried to figure out my next move, but my thoughts were a chaotic jumble. 
As daylight turned to dusk, I knew I'd have to stop for the night. I chose a big, well-lit truck stop on the outskirts of Atlanta. Maybe, just maybe, he'd lost my trail in the traffic. I could only hope. I pulled in as inconspicuously as possible, parking at the far end of the lot, and spent the evening scanning the crowds around me, jumping at every flicker of faded blue. The following morning, I hit the road early. I avoided the main truck stop diner, instead grabbing a cold breakfast sandwich and a coffee from the convenience store before heading back on the highway. I kept glancing in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see him reappear, but the miles stretched on without incident. I began to relax, just a little. Maybe I'd managed to slip away from him during the Atlanta rush. By late afternoon, I was closing in on my destination. The relief washing over me was nearly overwhelming. That's when I saw him again. He was driving a nondescript gray sedan, cruising on the shoulder, seemingly waiting. The feeling wasn't relief this time, it was a sickening drop of dread. As I approached, he merged into traffic, maintaining a steady distance behind me. My exit was coming up in a few miles, and my mind raced, trying to plan some kind of escape route. Should I go off the route, try to get lost on side roads? Alert the company? The thought of calling Sarah filled me with an unexpected stab of guilt. How could I explain any of this to her without causing worry? I took my exit and he followed, mirroring my every turn. The factory and its attached warehouse loomed ahead. Panic began to override logic. I couldn't lead him to the delivery point. But where else could I go? On a whim. I turned down a side road just before the factory. It was a narrow stretch, flanked by fields and a few scattered sheds storing what looked like farm equipment. I drove for about ten minutes, my heart thudding against my ribs. Finally, I approached a clearing and an abandoned-looking barn. This would have to do. I pulled my truck to a halt in the overgrown field and swung myself out the cab. He was nowhere in sight, likely blocked from view by a bend in the road. My escape plan was almost comically flawed, but I was beyond reason thinking. I bolted inside the barn, its interior dim and dusty. There were old bales of hay stacked against one wall. Desperation lent me a burst of frantic strength, and I started shoving them, creating a makeshift hiding spot. A clattering sound outside announced his arrival. I scrambled into the crude shelter and crouched down, pulling bales of hay to mask my presence. Through a gap in the rotting wood, I could see him. He had gotten out of his sedan and was walking towards the barn, those blue eyes scanning the landscape. My breath caught in my throat. It was only a matter of time before he came inside. He pushed the barn door open, and it creaked ominously. His shadow fell across the dirt floor as he stepped inside. He didn't walk far in, but stood just inside the threshold, as if sensing a change in the air. My heart pounded so hard I was sure he could hear it. I pressed myself further into my hiding spot. A long moment stretched out, pregnant with tension. He was so close I could smell the faint scent of stale tobacco and something like machine oil. Then he spoke, his voice a low rasp, surprisingly gentle for his rough appearance. Come on out, son. We need to talk. The gentleness in his voice was more terrifying than any outright threat. It was the voice of a predator coaxing its prey. I knew right then that there was no escape. He knew I was here, and some terrifying instinct inside him took pleasure in the hunter's game he was playing. Look, I don't know who you are or what you want, I called out my voice hoarse. I shoved a bale of hay aside, emerging from my hiding spot. He didn't flinch, just met my eyes with that same icy stare. 
My name is Randall, he said simply. Your name, Wesley, right? A chill ran through me. He knew my name. How? I started to ask, but he cut me off. That doesn't matter now. What matters is you made a big mistake. A mistake that might cost someone their life. His voice was chillingly calm, sending a shiver down my spine. What are you talking about? I asked, dread and anger mixing inside me. About two weeks ago, Randall continued, ignoring my question. You were up north. A town in Pennsylvania. Don't recall the name now. Some little place off the highway. And you hit someone. My blood ran cold. Hit someone? There was no. I faltered, the memory slamming into me in a sickening flash. A dark stretch of back road. Headlights cutting through the rain. A figure stumbling into my path. The thud, the sickening feeling that I'd hit something, or someone. Blind panic had seized me, and I'd kept driving, telling myself it had just been an animal, a deer maybe. The image of the figure crumpling against my windshield flashed, and I felt sick. He was drunk, maybe on something. Stumbled right in your path. But you didn't stop, Randall said, each word heavy with accusation. You left him there. Badly hurt, most like. Could be dead by now. I... I didn't know. I stammered, but even to my own ears, it sounded weak. Didn't know, didn't care. Randall's voice was harsh now, laced with contempt. He was my brother. The barn spun around me. It was so impossible, so unreal, that my brain refused to process it. Yet, looking at Randall, at those eyes that mirrored the same shade of blue as the figure in the rain-soaked darkness, I couldn't deny the truth. The realization brought on a crushing wave of guilt and self-loathing. I wanted to argue, to explain how terrified I'd been, but some essential part of me knew it wouldn't matter. A man was hurt, maybe even dead, and I was responsible. Randall had tracked me down to exact his own brutal kind of justice. What are you going to do? My voice sounded small, even to my own ears. Funny you should ask that. Randall reached into his pocket and pulled out a heavy-looking revolver. He leveled it at me, his hand disturbingly steady. I've been thinking about that myself. And I realized... A fair punishment is only fair, wouldn't you agree? I froze, unable to process the stark reality of the situation. Everything was happening too fast, the guilt, the revelation about his brother, the gun pointed at my chest. You left him on the side of the road. Randall continued, his tone flat. That's what I'll do to you. An eye for an eye, as they say. He walked towards me, his footsteps seeming to echo ominously in the barn's silence. I scrambled backwards until I hit the wall, panic seizing me. My eyes darted frantically around the barn, searching for an escape route, some weapon to defend myself. But there was nothing. I was trapped. He stopped a few feet away from me, that gun trained with lethal precision. Any last words? he asked, a mocking inflection in his voice. My mind raced, a desperate jumble of half-formed thoughts. I wanted to beg for mercy, to apologize, to somehow rewind time and undo the terrible events that led me here. But I knew it was useless. Randall wasn't interested in pleas or excuses. Instead, I closed my eyes a wave of resignation washing over me. In my mind, I saw Sarah's face. I saw the little house we bought, filled with half-formed dreams of a future that now would never be. Tell Sarah. I'm sorry. I choked out, my voice barely above a whisper. And then I waited for the gunshot that would end it all. The silence stretched out, 
a torturous beat followed by another. When nothing happened, I cracked open my eyelids. Randall was still there, weapon raised, but a flicker of something, hesitation, doubt maybe, seemed to have passed over his features. Then, as suddenly as he had appeared, he lowered the weapon with a sigh. Get out! His voice was surprisingly subdued, laced with a weary heaviness. Go on, before I change my damn mind. I couldn't believe it. A wave of hope pierced through the despair. But as I scrambled to my feet and rushed towards the exit, I heard the click of the hammer being raised once more. I spun back in time to see the gun pointed at me again. His eyes were no longer filled with cold fury, but with a deep, haunting sadness. And tell everyone you know what kind of monster you are, he said. That's your true punishment. Live with it. The gunshot echoed deafeningly inside the barn, but the bullet wasn't meant for me. I watched in horror as Randall raised the gun to his head and pulled the trigger. His body jerked, then slumped lifelessly to the dirt floor. I don't know how long I stood there, staring at his body. When I finally stumbled outside, the world seemed to tilt on its axis. I somehow managed to drive back to the highway, finding my way to a gas station where I called the police, my voice a hoarse whisper as I recounted the grim events. They came for me shortly after. The investigation, the questioning, the looks of disbelief mixed with pity, it all remains a blur in my memory. The news eventually reported it as a suicide, a grief-stricken brother unable to cope with the loss. No mention of the hit-and-run, no mention of the near-fatal retribution I'd narrowly escaped. The aftermath is a never-ending burden. I walk through life carrying the unseen weight of two deaths, the unknown figure on a Pennsylvania back road, and the man who collapsed in that desolate barn. I did turn myself in for the hit-and-run, received a lenient sentence with consideration taken for my extreme distress. But technicalities of the law don't absolve the guilt gnawing away at my soul. I never went back to long-haul trucking. I work in a warehouse now, same company, different job. I drive home every night to Sarah, whose concerned questions I deflect with half-truths and forced smiles. Our dream of a family died that day with Randall, replaced by unspoken anxieties and hollowed-out silences. Nightmares plague my sleep. Sometimes it's the rain-slicked road, the figure in my headlights. Other nights it's Randall, those icy eyes fixated not on revenge, but on a despair so vast it eclipsed his rage. I wake up in a cold sweat, Sarah stirring beside me the unspoken questions hanging heavy in the darkness. Some might say I got away with it. But there are prisons far worse than barred cells and iron shackles. Mine is made of endless roads, unblinking blue eyes, and the knowledge that no matter how far I run, there is never a true escape. I'm Terence Piper, a small-town cop in Stockville, Pennsylvania. My life revolved around patrolling the quiet streets and occasional bar fights, nothing unusual. Growing up here, I've known most of the residents my whole life. Today was different somehow. I could feel it in my gut as I walked through the sleepy town center. A call suddenly came through on the radio, a gruesome scene at an old, abandoned house on the edge of town. Without hesitation, I rushed to the location. The house was notorious for uncomfortable stories, but that never bothered me before. As a local, I heard all kinds of myths surrounding this place. Arriving at the decrepit house, I met with Officer Benson who was first unseen. Terence, she exclaimed, "'You need to see this!' As we approached the entrance, a distinctive smell hit us, 
a mix of sulfur and decay. The wooden door creaked. It was cracked open by what seemed like immense force. Entering carefully and focusing on the unnerving feeling that enveloped us, my flashlight danced across the decaying wallpaper. The living room looked like something out of a nightmare. Pieces of torn flesh littered the floor alongside mangled furniture. Office Benson's face had turned pale, but we both knew our duty. We had to investigate further. We moved towards a small room in the corner. It seemed untouched by whatever ravaged this place. Inside were stacks of newspapers and books containing clippings about mysterious local cases, missing persons, and unexplained deaths spanning decades. Suddenly, we heard something scratching outside the room, our hearts pounding against our chests as if trying to escape. Slowly opening the door, I caught sight of peculiar footprints leading down to the basement. Our best bet is to call for backup. Officer Benson suggested, her voice shaking slightly. But you know how long it will take them to get here. We need to find out what's happening. We descended into the darkness, following the eerie path of footprints. While doing so, I began mentioning some recollections about similar incidences I was involved in. Making a joke about how life never really turns out as planned. The basement housed a large tank of acrid water, half-submerged in muck. Emaciated bodies surfaced occasionally, only to sink back down, victims from far too many generations. Smeared against the tank was a symbol made from dried blood I didn't recognize. Suddenly, the beast emerged. It had two spindly legs that seemed to support an impossible weight its bark-like skin blending into its surroundings. The creature had no face, just a gaping hole that looked as if it had been ripped apart by something primal, and its body produced such an indescribable sound that somehow felt familiar. We both stared in shock and fought to comprehend what we were witnessing. Engaging in conversation with Officer Benson about our next step, we decided on reporting our findings immediately but knew we had little time before it would be too late. I knew I couldn't just stand there and do nothing. This creature was not only responsible for the gruesome scene in the house but for decades of missing persons and horrific deaths. The voice of reason was clouded by an overwhelming desire for justice and protection of my neighbors. It lunged at us with guttural screams piercing the air. We barely managed to dodge the attack I felt an iciness surrounding me as though it had torn through my very soul. With every ounce of strength left, I whipped out my gun and blindly fired at the abomination, hoping to land a hit. The bullets barely made an impact on the creature, but they seemed to slow it down a bit. Panic surged through me as I realized how futile my efforts were. Officer Benson had his gun up and fired as well, with similar results. Our weapons were insufficient against this monster. I could tell that calling for help was the only option left. My phone was in my pocket, but there wasn't enough time in between dodging the creature's attacks to make the call. With the creature focused on me, Officer Benson slipped around to the other side and began dialing for backup. As he called for assistance, I managed to reload my gun, adding distance between myself and the beast. The creature staggered towards me, its legs wobbling under its weight, making ripples in the water below as it moved. Its motivation for committing such atrocities remained a mystery, but its intent to cause harm was clear. Officer Benson barked orders into his phone while keeping one eye on the creature. We need backup immediately, he said frantically, relaying our location as quickly as possible. As we awaited reinforcements, we worked together to fend off the creature's relentless advances. Blinded by fear and determination, we ignored any physical pain we suffered from evading its attacks. Time seemed to stretch on endlessly until I heard sirens approaching in the distance. The cavalry had finally arrived. 
The other officers came sprinting down into the basement, guns drawn and ready for action. They formed a semicircle around the monstrosity as we filled them in on what little we knew about this nightmare come to life. The officers trained their guns on the creature and joined us in our futile assault. To our surprise, one of their bullets struck a weak point in the creature's bark-like hide and inflicted more damage than expected. The monster recoiled and screeched in pain, an unfamiliar sound that I could never forget. We seized the opportunity and continued firing at it, reinvigorated by the hope that we might be able to take it down. Each shot found its mark, and eventually, the creature's movements became sluggish. Just then, a plan formed in my mind. Officer Benson, shoot at its legs! I shouted, gesturing to the weakness we suddenly exposed. Together, we aimed our barrage of bullets at that specific location while praying that it would be enough. Remarkably, our persistence paid off. As the creature's legs finally buckled under its weight, a cheer erupted from all around us. The officers wasted no time in advancing on the strange being, quickly surrounding and subduing it as it lay inert on the floor. The ordeal finally had come to an end. Or so we thought. In the aftermath of the battle, an investigation was launched to determine where this creature had come from and how it was responsible for so many lost lives over the decades. Given our limited expertise in these matters, External researchers were brought in to study the bizarre specimen before ultimately disposing of it to prevent any further harm. As expected, questions still remained about the unexplained symbol smeared across the water tank and what connection it might have with the twisted events that unfolded here. In memory of all those who had fallen victim to this monster over time, friends, family members, a memorial was erected near the now-abandoned house as a tribute for their untimely demise. Perhaps my life will never return to normal after this chilling experience, but one thing was certain. I resolved never to let my guard down again. With every new day that dawned, I maintained a quiet vigilance against whatever other mysteries might be lurking just beneath our noses. I'd always enjoyed the simplicity of my daily life as a small-town cop in Huntsville, Alabama. My name is Darnell Kruger, and I was new to the friendly smiles and nods from my fellow Huntsvillians. They'd often joke about how dull it was here compared to the hustle and bustle of a big city like Birmingham. Murders are rare in our town. But one morning... I received an unusual call from dispatch concerning an individual who had been found mutilated in Town Creek Park. The mangled scene I walked into was terrifying. Kruger, barked Sergeant Berman Holtzman. I'll be honest with you. We've never seen anything like this here before. His usual grin had been replaced by a perplexed expression which caused me to tense up subconsciously. I surveyed the crime scene a man whose face had been torn to shreds, his limbs twisted like gnarled branches from an ancient tree. Forensic investigators discovered faint claw marks on his decaying flesh, but they were unable to draw any conclusions about what kind of animal would have caused such a display of bloodshed. After weeks of investigation with no leads or suspects, the case grew cold, and we moved on. Then, it happened again. Our once peaceful town was gripped by another brutal murder. This time, Casey Freebig's remains were found in her backyard near her children's abandoned swing set. Just like the last case, there were no identifiable fingerprints, nor any foreign DNA present at the scene. But the stark similarity between both victims troubled us all. Each suffered inconceivably grotesque deaths characterized by mutilations that only a demented creature could inflict. As weeks turned into months with no arrests made or traces as to who could be behind these gruesome events, 
a dark cloud of panic cast its shadow over Huntsville. No one could remember when or how the dread became a living thing, stalking our streets with terror in its wake. I had never been religious, but I began praying for answers. That night, when my wife Liza and I prepared to go to bed, she did her best to ease my concerns with a chuckle. Well, Darnell, she joked, Maybe we finally got ourselves one of those mythical monsters. She couldn't see it then, but her light-hearted remark did little to diminish the fear burgeoning deep inside me. That fear would manifest into something far more bone-chilling the next day when I responded to another distress call. This time from a sobbing old lady who claimed to have heard blood-curdling screams coming from a desolate house down the street. With the reported location firmly coiled within an intricate web of forgotten streets and twisting alleyways, we took our time finding the seemingly abandoned house. We cautiously stepped inside and began our search for any sign of life after realizing that the front door had been ripped off its hinges. As we wound our way through dimly lit rooms filled with family mementos and dusty furniture, we found no trace of bloodshed or struggle. Strangely enough, however, a penetrating pool of darkness seemed to consume the surrounding air as we ventured further into the dilapidated home. Suddenly, something smashed through the window in front of us, releasing shards of glass into the murky air like grisly projectiles on a mission to maim. It was immediately apparent that it wasn't human. This dark figure haunting us refused to reveal its true essence wrapped beneath layers of putrid translucent flesh that appeared vaguely humanoid. Our heartbeats accelerated as we desperately backed away from this elusive abomination. Frantically searching for an escape route amidst the disorientating chaos and debris threatened our lives with each passing second. My partner and I struggled to maintain composure as we edged through the disarray, always aware of the grotesque being that seemed intent on our demise. The floor creaked beneath our weight as we moved deliberately, eager to find an exit but hesitant to alert the creature to our whereabouts. I noticed the door slightly ajar, perhaps a pathway to safety. As my partner reached for the handle, the villainous beast lunged at us once again. Desperate for an escape, we dove through the half-open door, narrowly avoiding its grasp. The new room appeared empty, and we shuffled against the far wall so as not to be seen by the lurking fiend outside. We decided swiftly calling for help was our best chance at survival. I took out my phone and dialed emergency services, my hands shaking with terror. As soon as I whispered into the line that a monster was attacking us in this abandoned house, I could see disbelief in the operator's voice, not entirely unexpected given the extraordinary circumstances. My partner chimed in, explaining that whatever was pursuing us was strong enough to rip doors from their hinges and resembled nothing like any living creature known to humanity. At last, though still skeptical, the operator assured us that help was on its way. While waiting for reinforcements, we continued attempting to find a way out of this festering hellhole. We entered into a kitchen area with shards of broken dishes littering the floor. I clenched my teeth tightly as we tiptoed over pieces of shattered china, dreading each crunch underfoot but knowing our only option lay forward. We managed to reach the back door just as it happened— a piercing screech resonated through the house as pain exploded across my partner's face. Taken aback by his sudden agony and unsure of what had just unfolded before me, I hesitated long enough to witness one last showdown between my partner and the loathsome creature. He swung at it with all his might, forcing the terrible monstrosity back towards the room we had just fled from. With every ounce of strength he had left, he pulled me through the door and out of the house, locking the creature securely within. We collapsed in a heap onto the damp ground mere moments before emergency vehicles arrived at the scene. As I held my injured partner close, 
I could not fathom what had just occurred. Our minds grappled with potential explanations for our unearthly encounter. What kind of ghastly aberration could hold such ferocity and malice? Where did this abhorrent thing come from, and why did it choose to attack us? The days since our harrowing brush with death had been an unending barrage of questions and uncertainty. Those we had called upon for help in deciphering that night's events were left as perplexed as we were. Our organization was ill-equipped to deal with such incomprehensible phenomena. Despite our lack of answers or understanding, my partner and I took solace in knowing that by some inexplicable twist of fate, we had survived. Whatever grisly fate awaited us within that dilapidated home would, fortunately, remain untold to those who traverse life wholly unencumbered by malevolent monsters lurking in the shadows. And yet, I cannot shake the gnawing memory of the traumatic experience, how we barely escaped with our lives when faced with an adversary so terrifyingly atrocious in nature. One thing is for certain— Whatever that sinister creature may be, its existence serves as a chilling reminder that extraordinary malevolence lurks where you least expect it. And sometimes, even a simple distress call can unveil a world far more horrifying than anyone ever expected. It was a regular day at the office, and by noon, I felt hungry, so I decided to take a stroll to the nearby deli. My name is Jack Collins, and I live a pretty ordinary life working as an accountant in Everglades City, Florida. The town is small, with a close-knit community of folks living in houses set along canals leading to mangroves and the Everglades National Park. As I walked past the local park, I noticed someone local was missing. There were posters everywhere with their face plastered on it, last seen wearing a navy blue shirt and white shorts. This reminded me of when my sister went missing ten years ago, but no conclusive evidence was ever found. I overheard two local old folks talking about this unfortunate incident. That has been happening once every few decades around these parts. One of them then brings up an ongoing conspiracy about an unknown creature that feeds off locals every thirty years. I chuckled under my breath and thought to myself that people in small towns really love their myths. After slightly losing track of time while munching my sandwich, I realized it was time to head back to work. Just when I was about ten minutes away from the office, the sky suddenly darkened with heavy clouds rolling in. Rain poured down mercilessly as if washing away all the foul and unwanted elements from the earth. On my way back to work, alongside one of the canals filled with murky water and dense foliage at its banks, something caught my eye. There at its edge stood a colossal reptilian-like creature as tall as a house. Its ghastly scales were rough and jagged while its enormous eyes glowed like emeralds undaunted by fearsome long claws that extended below its robust hind legs. Instinctively, I hunched behind one of the metal dumpsters that were nearby to remain hidden. Unbeknownst to me, I could hear distressed screams off in the distance. It was very apparent now that this beast devouring missing persons had invoked terror among the townspeople. Seeing somebody being dragged away by the reptilian-shaped monster seared an image into my mind, filled with extreme horror and disgust. The creature's sharp teeth sank into the person, whose desperate high-pitched cries echoed through the nearby streets. In that moment, I remembered my phone and thought about calling for help. But then I realized, who would even believe me? A massive reptilian creature in a small town. It sounded ludicrous. I decided to take the matters into my own hands. As fear gripped me and panic washed over, I decided to follow the creature at a safe distance. If I were to stop this beast and rescue any potential victims it hadn't killed yet, I needed more information. 
For weeks on end, I meticulously mapped out its predictable movements. During this time, some new missing person cases popped up but went unnoticed by local law enforcement because no apparent threat was evident. I couldn't just watch people suffer any longer. It was time for action. Recruiting two of my closest friends, Alan Bainbridge and Lucy Yao, who were intrigued by my findings, we devised a plan to confront this monstrous being. Armed with hunting rifles from Alan's collection and knowledge from weeks of tracking its patterns, we set a trap near one of its usual feeding spots early one evening. The dark night blanketed Everglades City as we waited silently for our target to emerge. Suddenly it appeared on the horizon, slow at first but growing larger step by step. The creature seemed attracted by the bait we had set an array of rotting fish carcasses emitting odorous fumes into the night air while buzzing with flies. With every deliberate footstep towards us, adrenaline surged through our bodies. As it approached, we caught glimpses of its distorted reflection in the canal's murky water. It got closer and closer, the air growing thick with tension. The moment finally arrived as the grotesque beast moved right into our line of sight. Waiting for my cue, Alan and Lucy both prepared their rifles, fingers on the triggers. My heart pounded in my ears, and sweat dripped down my face as I gulped nervously. I signaled to Alan and Lucy, and we fired our rifles simultaneously. The thunderous shots echoed through the night. The creature staggered, shrieking a sound that pierced the air like the anguished screams of a thousand lost souls. It fell to the ground but, to our horror, began crawling towards us. Not enough. I gasped, vaguely aware of my own voice. Keep firing! Alan and Lucy relentlessly pulled their trigger fingers as the monstrous reptilian inched closer still. Its features were revealed in vivid detail. Grotesque scales covered its body protruding razor-sharp claws at the end of twisted limbs and a set of horrifically elongated fangs. Call for help! Lucy shouted between shots, panic threading her voice. I realized she was right, even though it might be too late. Taking a quick breath, I dialed 911 on my phone but received no response. Dead signal. We were on our own. The creature continued crawling towards us with its blood-curdling shrieks growing more terrifying each moment. It lunged at Alan suddenly, grabbing him with lightning-fast reflexes. Alan screamed as the monstrous claws tore into his flesh. No! I yelled and clenched my jaw as I unloaded every bullet I had into the beast. It shrieked and flopped backward in pain. Alan dropped to the ground limp and lifeless. Enraged and grief-stricken, Lucy let out a guttural cry and delivered a final shot directly into the monster's eye socket. The creature's movements ceased as it lay motionless on the ground. We had won but at an immense cost. Alan was gone forever. Lucy collapsed to her knees by Alan's side. Tears streamed down her face. The silence pressed upon us like a cruel burden we could not bear. Resisting my impulse to mourn just yet, I approached the creature's lifeless form. Examining it closely, the only conclusion that made sense was that it was something beyond human comprehension, like a reptilian alien species come to stalk among us. Lucy, I murmured softly, we need to report this to the authorities. Someone has to know. She nodded, wiping her tears away before standing next to me, determination in her eyes. But first, we'll pay our respects to Alan. We spent the next hours attempting to contact the police and any other relevant department. Eventually, we managed to share our story along with photographic evidence of the creature's body. A few days later, a group of government officials and scientists arrived in Everglades City. They recovered the creature's remains and conducted an investigation into our claims. 
Lucy and I attended Alan's funeral in silence. No words could come close to capturing our grief. The investigation continued for several months. Though our direct involvement had ceased after the initial report, we kept in touch with a sympathetic agent named Mark. As far as we knew, they couldn't identify its origin, merely confirming its unknown nature. Over time, Lucy and I settled back into a semblance of normal life. Yet we could never escape the brutal memory of what happened. Every day thereafter, I silently remembered my fallen friend Alan Bainbridge, an unlikely hero who made the ultimate sacrifice for what he believed in, protecting others from an unknown terror lurking in the shadows. And I swore to myself that should such dangers threaten our world again, I would meet them head on armed with the strength bestowed upon me by my friend's legacy, never hesitating or cowering in fear but standing tall against whatever horror fate may throw my way, no matter how gruesome or disturbing the threat may be. I was hiking in Yosemite National Park, hoping to clear my head after a rough divorce. My name is Gregor Winters, by the way. Hiking always helped me relax, especially since I had grown up around the beautiful landscapes of the park. How could I have known the bizarre and terrifying chain of events that awaited me? I reached a seldom-traveled part of the park which few people knew about. It was in this secluded area I first stumbled upon the remains of another hiker, their body disfigured and mangled in a way no ordinary animal could have done. Bones were twisted and flesh torn apart. Shaken by my discovery, I tried to call for help. Unfortunately, I found myself out of reach, unable to get any reception. A feeling of unease enveloped me and I decided to turn back and inform the park rangers about the mangled corpse. While retracing my steps, I noticed peculiar footprints in the mud. Though animal-like, they were too large and grotesque for any beast I knew of that lived in these parts. The footprints led deeper into an ambiguous thicket of trees I didn't dare enter but as a skeptic man myself, my curiosity gnawed at me. As night fell upon the park, I settled into my campsite, trying to shake off thoughts concerning what lurked in the forest. Sitting near the campfire with other hikers who shared stories about their adventures, I chuckled at one's joke about bear encounters. But deep down inside, dread wrestled with my need for camaraderie. One late evening when sleep refused to ease my troubled mind, I heard noises from afar an unsettling mix of growls and dragging sounds as if something was pulling a large object through dirt and gravel. It was then that panic surged through me like an electric shock. The next morning, two more hikers who ventured into the heart of the park were reported missing by their friends. Consequently, the park authorities organized a search party to look for them. I was invited to join and reluctantly accepted hoping that maybe if we found them alive, I could finally put this dread to rest. As the search party ventured deeper into the park, we discovered another gruesome sight. Two more shredded bodies awaited us in a menacing manner, their wounds mirroring those I saw before. Twisted limbs and torn flesh strewn about the earth like grotesque art pieces. The search was fruitless, we found neither the hikers nor any hint of their location, though we did discover more horrifying scenes, dismembered animals and those same distorted footprints, with each mile of our journey. We set up camp for the night under a veil of despair. Around the fire, a fellow searcher named Karina Jensen shared her story about witnessing strange occurrences in her backyard leading up to our recent discoveries. Her description sent shivers down everyone's spine even as the glow from the flames warmed our hands against the cold wind. Our group resolved to continue searching at first light, but fear left us lying awake in our tents for hours on end, 
wide-eyed with anticipation of what forgotten creatures lurked within this forsaken forest. It was now much clearer than before. We faced something unnatural in Yosemite National Park. As day broke and we reconvened around breakfast, Karina voiced out her concerns that maybe we should turn back or call for reinforcements. However, pride and determination won it over concern for safety. With steely resolve, we pressed onward into the dense thicket. Creeping through dim paths between ancient oaks as thick as houses or soaring pines piercing cloud-heavy skies above us gave that untraveled territory an eerie sensation, unlike anything I expected Yosemite National Park to offer its visitors. Suddenly, behind some foliage rustled a shadowy figure that sent tremors through the group when it stepped into view, bearing enormous teeth and exhaling a guttural roar that chilled our bones. Though the sound sent shivers down our spines, curiosity and fear compelled us forward, where we found ourselves staring at the monstrous silhouette of what used to be a cordial deer. Mauled and mangled beyond recognition, the horrific sight of the creature had us trembling uncontrollably. We instinctively retreated, moving away from the monstrous deer as it limped closer. The poor beast was clearly suffering, its previously nimble body now twisted and covered in bloody wounds. I realized we couldn't fight this creature on our own, and decided the best course of action was to call for help. Guys, I whispered as we tried to maintain a safe distance. I'll call for help. We can't deal with this on our own. My friends nodded in agreement, terrified by what we were witnessing. I pulled out my phone and dialed emergency services. As I explained our situation, they promised to send a team out to our location as soon as possible. While waiting for help to arrive, the creature continued to close in on us. Fear gripped us tight, but we kept retreating, wary of provoking further aggression from the mangled deer. Karina anxiously stared at it wondering how such a gentle animal had turned into this horrifying creature. Finally, we heard the distant sound of approaching vehicles, which seemed to agitate the disfigured deer even more. Its guttural groans grew louder and more frequent as it sensed its imminent capture. Backup arrived quickly, with park rangers and other searchers joining forces with us to face the monstrous beast. They brought tranquilizer guns to subdue it safely to prevent any further harm or damage. What on earth happened here? One of the park rangers asked me when he saw the gruesome state of the mutilated creature. We don't know, I replied as my voice trembled slightly. It was like this when we found it. As they cautiously approached the creature... It made one last desperate lunge towards one of the rangers before succumbing to multiple tranquilizer darts shot from well-prepared professionals. It dropped onto the forest floor with a heavy thud that resonated deeply with all of us who witnessed the scene. The park rangers tagged and secured the creature, preparing it for transport away from our group. They seemed as baffled as we were. Unable to comprehend the reason behind this bizarre transformation of a once gentle woodland creature into a nightmarish monster. When everything was finally over, and the distorted deer was out of sight, I tried to piece together what could have caused such a change. I inquired from one of the rangers about any known legends or possible explanations for this terrifying occurrence, but he shook his head in disbelief. I've never seen or heard of anything like this before, he said solemnly. And believe me, we see our fair share of strange occurrences in these forests. It wasn't until days later that I stumbled upon an obscure article about a local myth called the Shape Changer. The story spoke about a malevolent entity capable of transforming seemingly innocuous animals into fearsome and sinister versions of themselves to stalk and terrorize innocent victims. As unsettling as it was, it seemed to fit our chilling experience. However, no one wanted to accept a folktale as the explanation for what we had encountered. 
that deformed and mangled deer would forever remain a horrifying puzzle that loomed over all who had come face to face with it in Yosemite National Park. In the end, we all decided to leave the forest as soon as we could. We continued to search for answers and spread awareness about our encounter with that grotesque creature. No one knew whether other animals in the forest might suffer the same transformation or if it was merely an isolated incident. But one thing was certain, none of us would ever forget that harrowing day when Yosemite showed us its darkest secret. I found myself standing at the entrance of the majestic Yellowstone National Park, eager to start my new position as a park ranger. My name is Harris Krieger, and I recently moved here from the bustling city to seek solace in nature. I never imagined that my new life would bring me face to face with unimaginable terror. The park was lush and serene, teeming with wildlife and picturesque landscapes. I relished in the tranquility of it all, far removed from the chaos back in the city. Shortly after beginning my tenure, I became close friends with fellow rangers Veronica Heppelwhite and Oliver Fitzhugh. As seasoned rangers, they often shared their experiences and offered advice when needed. One day, we received reports about a group of campers who had mysteriously disappeared from their campsite. The entire area seemed undisturbed, as if they vanished into thin air. We assumed it was likely a prank, or they simply wandered off, so we organized a team to search nearby areas. As luck would have it, Oliver stumbled upon an unsettling scene as we traversed a remote trail dense with foliage. What remained of the missing campers laid before us, mauled and dismembered corpses strewn about like rag dolls. Our mouths dropped open in horror as we attempted to process the gory sight. The realization that something sinister was lurking in these woods anchored itself firmly in our minds. The ground rumbled softly before louder pounding shook nearby trees at intervals, like an approaching behemoth making steady strides towards us. We dared not speak as fear gripped our hearts and compelled us to ready our firearms for whatever nightmare lay ahead. Soon after, we caught glimpses of a monstrous creature through tangled branches. It resembled no known species found within park limits, or perhaps anywhere else on earth. Standing upright at an imposing height with limbs powerful enough to render human flesh to ribbons, it stalked its territory with a predator's grace. The terrifying realization sunk in. We were now prey to an indescribable abomination. Our initial reaction was to call for help, but the dense forest made it impossible to maintain a steady signal. We knew we couldn't rely on backup, so we had to survive using our wit and instincts. With loaded guns in hand, we tiptoed deeper into the woods, away from our butchered fellow campers. As the shadows grew denser and day turned to night, the sound of snapping twigs echoed through the forest. An acute sense of dread hung over us as we noticed that the creature had picked up our scent. Hoping that we could outsmart and outrun it, Oliver suggested splitting up and rendezvousing at a designated point later on. The relentless pursuit continued as I stumbled upon a grisly scene of mutilated park animals, nature's forewarning that something unholy was trespassing within its sanctuary. My pulse raced as the grotesque creations that littered my path seemed to foretell an unceremonious end for me as well. I inched closer towards my destination, hands shaking while clutching my rifle hoping that this unspeakable ordeal would soon be over. But fate had other plans. Heavy footsteps and guttural growls resonated all around me as the massive, malformed beast closed in on my position. Ignoring logic and self-preservation, I sprinted towards a steep ravine with mere nerves forcing my legs to comply with desperate abandonment. 
The creature mirrored my movement with malevolent intent etched into its grotesque visage. My heart pounded in my chest like a balled-up fist hammering against a creaky wooden door. Dark clouds converged overhead as rain began pouring down like shards of glass slicing through the air, as if nature itself recoiled at the unholy abomination that stalked me without mercy or remorse. Just when I thought my demise was imminent, Veronica and Oliver burst through the trees like the heroes in our childhood stories. They brandished their rifles and aimed defiantly at the creature as it cornered me against the sheer cliff face. Sweat dripped down my forehead as I whispered a silent prayer for divine intervention or an unsolicited miracle. I looked at Veronica and Oliver in disbelief, grateful for their timely intervention. Without hesitation, Veronica yelled, Run! We'll hold it off! I didn't have time to argue or question their decision, so I turned and sprinted towards the ravine. Behind me, I heard gunshots piercing the air while the creature roared in defiance. The sounds of claws scratching the ground and trees being pulled apart mingled with my friend's shouts and gunfire. It was hard for me to ignore the horrifying scene behind me, knowing my friends could lose their lives any second. Despite my fear, I forced myself to keep running and focused on finding help. I couldn't risk getting injured or killed by trying to fight the creature myself without any experience or knowledge of what we were up against. At last, I arrived at a small ranger station near the edge of the park. Gasping for breath and with desperation clawing at my heart, I quickly relayed to them about Veronica and Oliver fighting off something large and unknown among the mutilated animal corpses. Rangers immediately mobilized search teams while I waited impatiently in the relative safety of the station. They took into consideration not only my story but also the knowledge that an unknown creature could potentially threaten parkgoers' lives. It felt like days went by before news reached us about their findings. Rangers had found Veronica and Oliver Deep within the forest miraculously alive but severely injured from their confrontation with the beast. They discovered signs of a ferocious battle along the trail of destruction leading further into the wilderness. Upon hearing this, relief washed over me like gentle waves crashing into shore. We had all survived. But my relief was quickly replaced by confusion when they mentioned that tracking dogs were overwhelmed with fear when brought closer to where they fought the creature, which couldn't be explained. Detailed descriptions provided by local experts didn't match anything documented within wildlife records, but seemed eerily similar to alleged sightings of a folkloric creature called the Ripping Beast. It was reported to have massive size elongated limbs, sharp talons, and most disturbingly an insatiable appetite for blood and destruction. Every couple of years, mutilated animal fatalities would spike for several days before returning to normal, leaving behind no sign of the attacker. This theory couldn't be confirmed, but it shouldn't be discarded either. It was too specific in relation to our experiences. Park officials warn locals and tourists about potential dangers, urging everyone to stick to populated areas and follow guidelines established in case of emergency. As news spread about our harrowing ordeal, the park eventually became devoid of human presence, except for rangers assigned to patrol routes or respond to potential sightings of the ripping beast. I vowed never to step foot inside that park again, neither did Veronica or Oliver. The creature had left its mark on each of us without being stopped. What continued to haunt me was knowing that it still lurked within the darkness of that forest waiting for its perfect moment to strike again. With passing time and no further sightings, people gradually moved on from the terrifying events that took place in the park. However, Veronica, Oliver, and I could never forget what we experienced on that fateful day when our paths crossed with the ripping beast. 
Despite not knowing the creature's true nature or having evidence besides our collective accounts and the remnants of its savage attacks in the parks, we were bound by a shared burden. The knowledge that something unknown and horrifying still prowled the shadows beyond our reach. The aftermath has forced us into an eternal vigilance for signs that it had resurfaced. For if it did return one day, we knew we owed it not just to ourselves but also those who may find themselves standing where we once stood facing fear itself amongst ravaged carcasses of the innocent, praying desperately for a lifeline. As much as I wished we could offer them some semblance of reassurance, the simple truth remained that the unknown creature continued to exist beyond our ability to confront or understand it. It all started with a lousy signal. There I was, deep into the heart of Keystone National Forest in Pennsylvania, trying to put out a call in the off chance someone would hear me. It's not that I needed help, yet, but these woods have a way of making you long for human contact. My name's Devin Holloway, an experienced hunter who prefers solo hunting trips as the best form of meditation and escape from a monotonous nine-to-five job as an insurance agent. Of course, my wife Susan wasn't thrilled every time I left for another trip, but it was my only true passion that drove me forward. The air grew colder as shadows lengthened between trees. Mild unease crept up my spine as I recalled the locals whispering about unexplained disappearances in these woods. On any other day, I would have laughed it off. But walking alone through this vast forest had me questioning the logic behind those tales. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream cut through the silence. My body tensed. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I instinctively reached for my rifle. No bird or beast could make such a sound. It belonged to a human in pain and terror. I followed the echo of the scream and stumbled upon something beyond belief. Mangled remains of a fellow hunter strewn across the forest floor, limbs twisted into unnatural shapes, blood pooled around what was left of his lifeless body. An eerie silence engulfed me once more. No birds sang nor wind rustled leaves in surrounding trees. A thick fog crept in, obscuring my vision and amplifying every footstep's echo. The sudden shift ignited fear within me that I had never experienced before. Logic failed to explain what happened to that man. A typical predator? Unlikely. The scene suggested something far more malevolent and gruesome at play. I swallowed this revelation and gripped my rifle tighter, determined to uncover the truth. Why wasn't he able to call for help? Venturing further into the fog... I noticed an odd trail of blood and crushed foliage leading deeper into the woods. The thickening fog shrouded my vision as I followed the signs left behind by whatever mysterious creature lurked before me. I kept hearing unfamiliar sounds, terrifying growls and snarls only growing closer. Then, out from the shadows, a horrific figure emerged stood taller than a man on hind legs with razor-sharp claws protruding from its hairy paws. It was no bear I had ever encountered on all my hunting trips in Pennsylvania. The creature raised its sinister gaze to meet mine. Amber eyes glinted, reflecting a malice only nature at its darkest could produce. Its mouth opened wide, revealing rotting rows of dagger-like teeth drenched in blood. A low fiendish growl escaped its throat. As its massive paws pounded against the ground in pursuit, primal instincts kicked in. Fight or flight consumed me as this monster closed in with each fearful stride. Rifle in hand, I aimed to shoot, but my trembling fingers caused the bullet to miss my target. Realizing my shot missed, panic set in as I turned to flee. The creature's malevolent growl became louder, 
and I could feel the massive weight of its paws slamming against the earth from just a few feet away. My mind raced through scenarios, me being hunted, torn apart, or worse. My rifle was useless now. I had thrown it to the side and sprinted through the trees, branches whipping at my face as I gasped for air. Adrenaline pushed me beyond anything I'd ever experienced before. For a brief moment, I thought of calling for help, but my fear paralyzed any hope of using my voice. Everything happened so fast. Suddenly, Jackson came into view my hunting partner who had gotten separated earlier in the fog. He was armed with his shotgun and listened intently as I quickly described the creature chasing me. Jackson's eyes widened with fear, and he nodded at me to keep running while he braced himself against a tree for support. Go! he shouted as he took aim into the fog behind me. I didn't hesitate and continued running, praying that Jackson's shotgun would buy us some time against this horrifying beast. With every footstep, however, my chest tightened in guilt for leaving him behind. Eventually, I found refuge in an old cabin that we had discovered and frequented on previous trips. Not having time to think about how flimsy the structure was or what horrors had befallen that cabin in its past, I barricaded the door, as Jackson had taught me, using furniture piled against it. Moments later, my breathing slowed down enough that I could hear snarls and growls outside. It sounded like the creature wanted revenge for my escape attempt. As the hours dragged on with no break-in or sign of its departure, anguish gnawed at me where was Jackson. Was he still alive? Determined to face the reality, I pushed my ear against the door and strained to hear any signs of Jackson. No shotgun blasts. No shouts. Only eerie silence met my ears. Could this nightmare have swallowed him up? As dawn broke, the fog began to dissipate, and I gathered my courage. Taking a deep breath, I slowly moved the barricade with trembling hands and cautiously peeked outside. The woods appeared calm and quiet as though nothing sinister ever occurred. Gnawing fear propelled me back towards the direction where I last saw Jackson. With a dread-filled heart, I followed the scattered signs of struggle-torn clothing, broken branches, until finally reaching a devastating sight, Jackson's lifeless body. There was no doubt in my mind that this unnatural creature had attacked him, leaving mangled flesh and shredded clothing in its horrific wake. With a churning stomach, I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. Once police arrived on the scene, their questions flooded in. Fear swirled through me as I anticipated being accused of some heinous crime or painted as an insane person recounting an impossible story. But as I retold everything that had happened in painstaking detail the creature pursuing us, escaping to the cabin, finding Jackson's brutalized remains they listened quietly and attentively. Then, without pause or explanation, they began an exhaustive search for evidence of this monstrous threat. As days turned into weeks without further incident, memories of my best friend's chilling death plagued me during sleepless nights. We never learned what kind of creature had torn through our quiet corner of Pennsylvania, whether it was a hideously mutated bear or something beyond description, but it was clear mankind didn't hold all knowledge of our world. I vowed from that moment forward to avoid mentioning folklore or paranormal theories. The brutal reality was far more disturbing than any tale passed around a campfire at night. A horrifying truth had shattered my life, leaving me in the ruins of tragedy the earth was home to terrifying creatures we knew nothing about, and death had a way of lurking in the shadows, waiting for us. In the dense, shadowy forest of Akeley Woods, Vermont, 
I had gotten used to the muffled sounds of wildlife and rustling leaves as I stalked my quarry. My name is Jerry Hutchinson, and I'd been hunting for years. It was a family tradition passed down from my grandfather. The camaraderie among us hunters was something that brought me comfort and a sense of belonging. The riddle of several missing persons in our small town had made me uneasy lately, and today I could feel their weight upon me, despite the warm sun filtering through the trees above me. My good friend Pete Langstrom, whom I often hunted with, had disappeared just like that three weeks ago. No one understood what was happening, but we could never have foreseen what awaited us in these woods. As I trudged through the surprisingly damp undergrowth, sudden laughter startled me the cackling of an insane man. Suspicion crept up my spine as I gripped my rifle tighter. Even if it were just another hunter or camper, why would they be laughing so intensely? My lungs felt tight and my heartbeat quickened as I pushed forward seeking the source of the ominous laughter. Trees gave way to a small clearing where a figure clad in tattered clothes leapt about like a crazed man-man, or maybe it wasn't human at all. Its body seemed unnaturally contorted, with elongated limbs and fingers ending in curved claws that scraped against each other when it moved. As I observed from a distance trying to make sense of this soul-chilling scene, something told me that, human, no longer applied to this creature predating the untamed forest. My breathing hitched in my throat when dark memories surfaced snippets of fireside stories describing mythical creatures that haunted Akeley woods, grotesque monsters with razor-sharp teeth, and claws that ripped apart their victims. Those terrifying tales, which used to send shudders down my spine, suddenly seemed more real. Pinning down our town's disappearances on a creature seemed childish at first, but now I began to entertain the morbid possibility. Inching closer in pursuit of the truth, I decided to try and capture it, if only to free my friends and fellow townsmen from its haunting presence and avert an untold disaster. My hand white-knuckled around my rifle at the ready, my throat dry like sandpaper. It wasn't a sensible idea to face something so unpredictable alone, but there was no other choice. I stepped on a twig the noise reverberated throughout the woods, and in that split second, the creature turned its mangled head towards me with shocking speed. Its eyes bore into mine with an intensity that mirrored the most primal animal instincts raw hunger and bloodlust. A surge of adrenaline propelled me into action as I fired my gun into its contorted form. But as soon as I pulled the trigger, it lunged forward grotesquely fast despite being hit, gnashing teeth bared for attack. The sheer brutality behind its charge terrified me more than any ghost story ever did. Out of sheer instinct, I sprinted away from the creature, my pounding heartbeat echoing in my ears. My movements felt sluggish, as if running underwater. I knew that calling for help was useless. I was deep in the forest, far from any civilization, and this monstrous attacker wouldn't hesitate to harm anyone who dared approach it. As the creature pursued me with an eerie determination, its twisted limbs propelled it forward with a speed beyond natural explanation. It stayed on my heels, the sounds of its rasping breath and snapping jaws making my skin crawl. My only hope was to evade it long enough to find some form of sanctuary or rescue. Taylor, a fellow woodsman and close friend, had mentioned an old shack he'd stumbled upon about a week ago. It was hidden within the winding woodlands occupied by this relentless predator, and although run down, it could potentially provide a glimmer of survival hope if only momentarily. Through sweat-streaked vision and panic-fueled thoughts, I recalled as Taylor pointed out the general direction of the hut during our fishing trip last weekend. My memory tried in vain to align itself with my staggering surroundings, but eventually, a vague bearing formed within the recesses of my mind. With every ounce of strength left in me, 
I veered swiftly toward where I believed the shack lingered legs burning and lungs begging for respite. Moments later, I burst into a small clearing where the dilapidated building stood as if waiting for me. Wasting no time and barely stifling a gasp of relief, I threw myself into its relative safety before slamming the door shut behind me. The sudden silence was deafening as my ears strained for any sound that indicated the creature had followed. I scanned quickly for something anything that could barricade me between those flimsy wooden walls and the nightmarish beasts lurking beyond them. Clumsy hands moved an antique bureau against the door, praying that this ramshackle structure could withstand the brute force that would undoubtedly follow. Sure enough, only moments later the creature's furious snarls erupted outside, followed by thrashing against the shack. Every impact reverberated through my chest, as if each slam was instead pounding on a thousand heavy drums. This continued for what felt like an eternity before suddenly, and inexplicably, it ceased. The bizarre quietness filled me with a sense of foreboding. Time felt suspended as I tried to quiet my breathing, each drawn breath feeling like a shout that would draw the creature back. Unsure of what my next move should be, I decided to wait for daybreak. As the sky began to faintly lighten through the cracks in the walls, the creeping realization slowly dawned on me. This creature was some sort of mutated animal its physical characteristics and voracious appetite for blood unlike anything documented before. It had clearly evolved to become an unparalleled predator designed for hunting its unsuspecting prey whether human or otherwise. With daylight seeping into the shack, I silently questioned if this dreadful creature feared sunlight or daylight held no consequence to it at all. There was only one way to find out. I mustered my courage and dismantled my makeshift barricade. My hands shook as I splayed them against the cold wooden door, drawing in a deep breath before pushing it open cautiously. As the door swung open my eyes desperately scanned for any sight of that terrifying figure and were met with nothing but empty dawn woods. Without wasting another precious second, I bolted away from the shack and back toward town. A newfound determination fueled each desperate stride closer to safety. My thoughts swirled around enlisting Taylor's assistance in tracking down this abomination littering death throughout Akeley Woods. As I arrived at his doorstep bruised and traumatized physically and mentally Taylor barely recognized me, but he listened attentively. He agreed without hesitation that we needed to work together in order to put an end to the menace stalking our beautiful town. The creature had no idea it was now the hunted. I'm Arnold Edmonds, a member of a classified task force focused on hunting monstrous creatures that threaten our world. I'm currently stationed in the dense woods of the Pacific Northwest, known for its towering trees and seemingly never-ending wilderness. This place is not for the faint of heart, especially with our current mission. My colleagues, Harlow Sobieski and Keaton Norwood, were also part of this task hunting team. We formed a tight-knit trio backed by years of experience and countless successful missions. It's these moments when I can't help but remember my wife and kids, tucked away safely at home while I risk everything to protect them. Our first lead came from a string of unusual missing persons cases, all from the same general area, scattered over the past months. The authorities had no idea what happened to these individuals. The tension was palpable as we began our investigation. After enough time spent out here, you learn that Mother Nature can be ruthless, but this felt different. While tracking down any signs of the creature responsible for these disappearances, Harlow discovered a horrifying scene deep in the woods, the remains of an encampment, splattered with blood and completely torn apart. 
What could do such brutal damage to a well-prepared group? We proceeded with caution. Another gruesome discovery followed soon after, a mutilated body hanging from tree branches above us. It dangled eerily above us as if fate wanted to send a message. It would seem that getting ourselves noticed was not such a challenge for this creature after all. It became apparent during our discussions about the facts and findings. We were dealing with something different than any creature we had encountered before, something even more sinister than our worst fears could have imagined. When our first encounter occurred with the creature, its form took us by surprise. It had long limbs and sharp claws, its body covered in dark fur that blended effortlessly with its surroundings. The creature had no discernible face and emitted a soft, menacing growl that sent chills down our spines. Arnold, look out! Keaton shouted as the creature lunged at me, barely dodging its swift attack. Harlow tried to call for backup on our handheld radio, but to no avail. The signal's dead out here, we're on our own, she said with resignation. It was clear that this time... We were isolated and without support. However, our training hadn't been for nothing. We relied on extensive practice and teamwork to confront this nightmare. We managed to set traps in the forest to slow down the beast, tripping it up by using trip wires and snares, earning us some crucial distance. Keaton kept a nervous tone in his voice as we continued our journey. Did either of you guys ever imagine something like this would happen when you signed up for the task force? I never thought I'd face something this terrifying, Harlow replied solemnly. But we've made it this far by staying together. We won't let it get to us. We have to stop this monster before it takes more lives, I added fiercely. Everything up to that point was nothing compared to what ensued next. As dusk approached and darkness enveloped the forest land, an unnerving silence pervaded the thick atmosphere around us. Suddenly, the creature ambushed us from behind, mauling Keaton before he had any chance to react, taking away not only one of our finest members but also a cherished friend. Our pain turned into fury when Harlow picked up Keaton's weapon and fired at the beast. The creature howled, retreating deep into the shadows of the woods. But it didn't feel defeated nor done with us. With heavy hearts, we continued our escape in silence, determined to avenge Keaton. Harlow led the way, using her expert navigation skills to guide us through the thick undergrowth and treacherous terrain. We need to get back to headquarters and report this, I suggested. We have no weapons left and we don't know when that thing could ambush us again. Agreed, Harlow replied. We've lost our communication devices. We'll need to find a nearby town with a phone. While forging ahead trying to reach civilization as quickly as possible, we formulated a plan to secure help against the creature. However, our desperate plight made it clear that the situation was beyond our expertise. Just as we crossed into a more accessible area where we hoped to find help, the beast surged glaringly from behind. Caught unaware by its startling appearance, it attacked Harlow digging its claws into her leg with an unyielding grip. I lunged at it without thinking fueled by pure adrenaline, trying desperately to fend off the attacker. Struggling my hardest to fight back, I managed to weaken its hold on Harlow and she limped away from immediate danger. Swiftly retreating, we found a secluded shed where Harlow could treat her injured leg. Helping her inside, I set out creating a primitive barricade for protection from the lurking menace. Harlow winced in pain as she hastily applied first aid supplies at her disposal. The makeshift tourniquet slowed the seemingly unstoppable bleeding from her wounds. Dragged along by necessity broken down, and exhausted we pushed ourselves forward until finally reaching a small roadside diner. The owner was well aware of strange phenomena in this part of the woods, 
but never experienced anything firsthand, only heard second-hand tales of bizarre occurrences. Stealing his resolve while pondering our dire predicament, he decided to help us contact our superiors. Listening intently to our harrowing account of recent events, he allowed us the use of his landline. Despite getting a still-functioning connection, no one answered at headquarters. We could only leave a detailed message on their voicemail. Fearing for our lives and desperate for assistance, we pleaded with the operator to take it upon herself to notify someone higher in the chain of command, no matter how outlandish our story might seem. Our time was running short. The diner owner agreed to drive us a safe distance from the creature's territory, giving us some breathing room while we waited for backup. In those perilous hours leading up to our evacuation, we recounted everything we knew about the creature. Nothing in our collective experience allowed us to ascertain its true nature or origin. Only vague conjectures derived from zoological hypotheses and theories. Its powerful build and fast movement resemble some form of animal. Harlow noted somberly as she nursed her leg. But the intelligence and cunning displayed during its ambushes set it apart from any known species. Eventually, after what felt like an eternity, a rescue team arrived to transport us back to headquarters. Since any communication had been futile due to severed signals in the area, they deduced something must have gone awry. Once safe in familiar surroundings and out of danger's grip, we thoroughly debriefed our commanding officers on the mysterious creature. With support from multiple units on standby, they devised a plan involving well-trained professionals equipped with top-tier technology to confront this elusive beast. The memory of Keaton loomed heavily throughout that operation, driving us towards neutralizing this inhuman monster once and for all. Closure seemed paramount not just in honor of our fallen comrade but also for any future task force members tasked with investigating strange occurrences in those troubled woods. Years later, I reflect on those harrowing days battling near yards away from malevolent carnage in the remote forest land. Our assumptions about the creature's existence and characteristics were inconclusive. Ultimately, Keaton's death will forever remind me of the horrors lurking beyond human comprehension and why perseverance is our only viable recourse in the face of such unspeakable darkness. I'm Greg Huxley, standing near the entrance of Aokigahara Forest in Japan a dense woodland notorious for its eerie atmosphere and unsettling history. I work for a task force that specializes in hunting and tracking monsters. Today was the beginning of yet another secret mission. Our team, comprised of talented individuals like Daria Zukov and Elias Mulder, gathered together to discuss our strategy. We were investigating a string of disturbing disappearances that left families devastated without answers. We set off into the forest, armed with specialized equipment like thermal imaging goggles and firearms loaded with explosive rounds. As we traveled deeper into the woods, Daria mentioned she left school on scholarship to become an engineer only to abandon her dreams when faced with a monstrous threat. The forest grew darker and our senses heightened as we moved cautiously through the tangled undergrowth. We came upon an abandoned campsite covered in blood, but something about it sent shivers down my spine. It wasn't just gory. It was perverse as if whatever did this was taunting us. Discussing this sickening discovery, Elias quipped, Looking on the bright side, at least they didn't have to pay off their student loans. I chuckled nervously, any levity appreciated in such a grim situation. We continued searching for answers or survivors but found neither, only more gruesome carnage hinting at an unimaginable threat. One still evening, as the sky grew pitch black and cool air settled around us, 
we stumbled upon a cave entrance, partially obscured by foliage. Before entering Old Man Thompson jokingly warned us not to be eaten by bears. He was always good at easing tensions during difficult search missions like this one. As we pushed deeper into the cave with nothing but our rugged determination guiding us forward, suddenly there was a piercing yelp from Old Man Thompson. Lurching around against the darkness basking upon what little light we all could glean together. There it was, an incredible mass of muscle and sinew towering over us. Its eyes glowed yellow with an almost primal intensity, as its massive claws dripped with dark blood. The creature before us resembled a bear, but its twisted anatomy hinted at something far more sinister. It moved lightning fast for something so large, pinning Thompson against the wall with one huge paw. Branches and rocks snapped under the force as we all spread out and tried to retaliate. Try to flank it! Elias shouted while firing a barrage of shots at the creature, but it hardly seemed phased by our weapons. Daria attempted to contact headquarters through our radio, but her frantic calls for help were met only with a deafening silence that echoed throughout the cave in reply. As the creature raised its other paw to strike, I couldn't help but think about my son at home waiting up for me while I raced into danger day after day. The demon's attack missed my chest by mere inches as I rolled out from under its deadly reach. The cave's cold air enveloped us, and I felt a mixture of fear and determination. We had a responsibility to protect the lost civilians who wandered into this cave but we were also faced with a terrifying force beyond our comprehension. While I was distracted, a crushing weight hit me from behind. The air left my lungs as I was thrown against the wall, narrowly avoiding the twisted bear-like creature's incoming blow. Get out! Get out of the cave now! Old Man Thompson screamed as he struggled under the massive paw pinning him against the wall. It was hard to leave the old man alone in that dark, treacherous place as we scrambled back toward the cave's entrance. But there was no way we could fight that thing without more firepower or without knowing what it truly was. We needed to call for help. Elias went outside to ensure a clearer connection with headquarters while Daria and I paused at the cave entrance, listening for any sign of Thompson or the beast. Through ragged breaths, Elias managed to get in touch with our team outside and describe our situation, begging them for backup. As we waited for their arrival, time seemed to slow down. Every second felt like an eternity, with our minds racing about what was happening inside that cave. My chest tightened when I heard screams echoing from the depths of the cavern below. Their pain was palpable, and it only heightened our sense of urgency and panic. Finally, a heavily armed rescue team arrived, led by Commander Stevens. Upon hearing about our encounter with the creature, Commander Stevens immediately ordered us to remain behind while his team ventured deeper into the cave system. Though we wanted to go back in and help Thompson, we knew that retreat was our best option at this point. Anything else would likely lead to more deaths and injuries. So we hunkered down near the entrance of the cave, which seemed like an entirely different world now, and prayed for Thompson's safe return. Hours crawled by as we kept vigil in the chilly night air. No sounds could be heard from within except for the occasional distant echo reminiscent of a terrible battle. I thought about old man Thompson when we first found that cave, how he tried to ease our nervousness with jokes. Now my heart clenched with dread, wondering whether those would be his last laughs. Without warning, a bloodied figure stumbled out of the darkness. It was Thompson, injured but alive. He collapsed at the entrance of the cave, his breath ragged and strained. Daria quickly tended to his wounds as Commander Stevens and his team emerged from the shadows. Debriefing ensued as we regrouped in the safety of our base camp. 
Commander Stevens explained that they had found several mutilated remains, presumably belonging to recently lost civilians. They also discovered the remains of what appeared to be an unknown species of mutated bear deep within the cave system, killed by their relentless gunfire. The base's scientists studied photographs taken by the team during their mission and determined that although there was no definitive answer about its origin, the creature shared some characteristics with known bear species but had mutated grotesquely. Though speculation swirled about radiation exposure or secret science experiments gone wrong, we knew that answers were still far off in the distance. The search mission ended with a bittersweet victory. We had successfully located and killed an unknown menace but in exchange for countless innocent lives lost and a haunting sense of uncertainty about whether more creatures like it lurked in hidden corners of our world. In time, we returned to our duties, rescuing lost civilians and exploring mysteries. But old man Thompson's injury forced him into retirement. I visited him frequently back in town reminiscing about memories shared during our countless missions together over mugs of hot coffee each steaming brew warming our hands against the chilling thought of that page in our lives. We never managed to uncover the creature's true origin or whether its kind truly ceased to exist. But we remained forever vigilant, with a sense of urgency to stay alert and alive in a world where unimaginable nightmares could emerge from the darkest corners at any moment. I was munching on a bland granola bar, which tasted like a mix of sawdust and mildly sweetened cardboard when I first arrived at the secluded fishing cabin deep in the forest of Baxter State Park, Maine. My name's Leander Buttonworth, and contrary to my seemingly boring disposition, I found myself drawn to the great outdoors. A simple employment ad had brought me here. The owner of the cabin, a man named Ambrose Stillingfleet, hired me to help with some renovations on his property. It was mundane work, something I didn't usually do, but the fresh air was therapeutic. Ambrose was an odd fellow. He had a penchant for making up absurd stories as he worked, tales involving squirrel armies and talking trout. Whenever I asked if these were true, he just emitted a peculiar chuckle and continued hammering away. One evening, while we were hunched over our bowls of warm pea soup carefully crafted by Ambrose himself, he told me about a series of grotesque hunting incidents that had been occurring in the area recently. It ain't no ordinary predator we're dealing with, he solemnly warned. Folks found their hunt all mangled like, bones gnawed down to nothing. Some even swear they've seen a cruel beast lurking around. The mere thought of this unseen creature sent shivers down my spine. But being skeptic in nature... I brushed away these nervous thoughts and asked for another spoonful of soup. The following morning commenced like any other day at the cabin, assembling planks and measuring angles. But something felt off. I noticed that even Ambrose looked more tense than usual as he went about his work muttering to himself worriedly every now and then. We were refurbishing one side of the cabin when Ambrose grabbed my shoulder and whispered anxiously. Do you see that there in the distance? Round that bend over yonder? Squinting, I spotted a colossal shadow emerging from the forest. The faint outlines of elongated limbs and a deer-like skull with sharp antlers loomed into view. I could almost taste the noxious stench of decay emanating from its frame. The slow realization that resembled swallowing lead pierced me. It was the creature Ambrose had been talking about. My mind screamed to call for help or scramble up the nearest tree, but no signal and paralyzed legs were hardly helpful. I locked eyes with Ambrose, who had gripped onto his old hunting rifle, knuckles white from the pressure. We exchanged nods as he whispered under his breath. We have no other choice. Creeping cautiously towards the creature, 
we couldn't fathom what it could be capable of. Yet, despite this utterly terrifying situation, we saw humor in our torturous predicament. Why did the predator chase its prey? Ambrose whispered so lowly that I nearly missed it. With a nervous grin, I shrugged and whispered back, No idea! Just for the thrill of the chase, he replied. Our laughter felt foreign but eased some tension in that moment as we fully accepted our dire circumstances. Shrouded in resolute determination, we moved through the trees, feeling distinctly insignificant against nature's magnificence yet undeterred in our quest to confront this vicious monster. We continued our cautious approach, trying to come up with a plan. The creature, still unaware of our presence, was focused on whatever it was doing, perhaps searching for prey. It seemed like our only chance to slip past unnoticed. I looked around and saw a cluster of large rocks nearby. If we could somehow make it there without attracting attention, we might be able to use them as cover and make our escape. But first, we needed a distraction. Grabbing a fallen branch from the ground, I snapped it in two and handed one half to Ambrose. We flung the pieces of wood in the opposite direction of where we planned to head. As soon as the branches landed in the underbrush, the creature's head snapped towards the noise it had made. Mustering every ounce of courage in both our bodies, Ambrose and I darted towards the rocks as quietly as possible. We had made it halfway when we heard a guttural growl behind us. The creature had spotted us. Our hearts pounded wildly as we picked up speed, adrenaline coursing through our veins. No signal meant no help. Only fear and determination fueled us now. Ambrose grunted as his aged body struggled to keep up. The creature was gaining on us, its elongated limbs moving with surprising speed considering its size. An unearthly screech filled the air as its sharp antlers swiped ferociously. In that instant, something caught my foot and I tumbled onto the forest floor a large gnarled root entangled me mercilessly. Ambrose turned around desperately at my cry and aimed his hunting rifle at the creature for an impossible shot. Run! I yelled at him, but he was too stubborn this was his hunting ground after all. Ambrose fired a bullet into the creature's skull-like face with trembling hands. It recoiled violently but didn't go down. He fired another shot, no luck. The creature continued its charge, angrier and more determined than before. My fingers fumbled on the root, trying to untangle myself. I had to do this. I had to survive. Ambrose, still defiant, continued firing at the monstrous being while shouting at me to get up. The creature bellowed an ear-splitting cry as it collided with Ambrose, throwing him against the tree. Its antlers pierced his abdomen as he struggled weakly against its terrifying strength. A sudden surge of adrenaline coursed through me once more. I managed to break free from the root, just as the creature threw Ambrose aside like a broken toy. He let out a pained groan, badly injured, but still alive. Summoning my last ounce of energy, I limped towards the rock cluster, almost there. The creature reared up on its hind legs, about to deliver a crushing blow on both of us. But just then, a deafening crash echoed through the forest. An enormous tree had fallen unexpectedly onto the beast's back. With the creature crushed under the weight of the tree and incapacitated for the moment, I seized my chance to pull Ambrose towards the rocks. We made it there and tried to catch our breaths as best we could. Neither of us dared speak. It was as if this nightmarish reality knew not even whispers were tolerated. We huddled against one another behind our makeshift cover in defiance of despair and with little hope. As light finally broke over the horizon, fading away that seemingly never-ending night of terror, we looked towards where we left the creature trapped beneath a tremendous fallen tree trunk. Only silence lingered now. No alien screeches or guttural growls marked its presence beneath those ancient timbers. 
A feeling of receding chaos hovered in that morning air while we tended silently to Ambrose's terrible injuries. We didn't know if the creature was alive or dead, and neither did we have any clue what it was or what drove it to attack us. What was clear was that life had taught us yet again to expect the unexpected. Though broken and battered, Ambrose and I survived. Nature's indiscriminate magnificence had shrouded our darkest encounter in a veil of quiet beauty. I thought back on that whispered joke we shared earlier the thrill of the chase and smirked with disbelief as I glanced at Ambrose, our eyes silently acknowledging a bleak moment of humor in our terrifying night. It all started with a joke. I never thought it would spiral into something out of a nightmare. My name is Harris Linden, and my buddies and I decided to take a trip to this old, abandoned asylum in Kentucky that people claimed was haunted. We didn't believe in any of the supernatural stories, but we had nothing better to do that weekend. Little did we know what awaited us. We reached the asylum in our pickup truck, marveling at its eerie and dilapidated state. Parts of the walls were crumbling down, and vines overtook the exterior like tentacles of an ancient beast. As we ventured inside, we could see graffiti coating some of the walls, remnants left by other explorers who had passed through here over the years. My friends Kester Tremaine and Tillman Banks accompanied me, laughing as we joked and walked down the dimly lit corridors with flashlights in our hands. As we explored more of the asylum, it was clear that it had been left untouched for quite some time, with dust covering every surface and bones scattered around from small animals that must have taken shelter here. We heard a strange noise coming from one of the rooms as we approached the end of a hallway. Was it your stomach, Tillman? Kester teased while pointing his flashlight at his friend. Tillman responded by laughing out loud and jokingly punching Kester in the arm. But soon enough, our laughter died down when we entered that room. The walls seemed damp like they were crying dark tears so slowly sinking into a pool on the floor. Amidst this decay stood an inexplicable sight— wooden beams formed an odd structure that vaguely resembled an animal or creature. This thing had a tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs, which remained unnervingly still. As we looked closer at this recomposed figure, Kester remarked that its head appeared like a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers protruding from the top. Not expecting to see something so bizarre, we inspected the structure further. Suddenly, the skull's eyes glowed, and this uncanny beast came to life. It released a guttural, otherworldly sound and moved its limbs with alarming speed and agility. Stunned, we found ourselves unable to move as our flashlights danced in its glare. Dropping our flashlights out of sheer fear, we stumbled backward as this creature leaped forward, making it crystal clear that it wasn't here for pleasantries. Guys, run! I managed to yell, breaking free from my shock. Bolting through the hallway as fast as our legs could carry us, the agonizing screeches reverberated in our ears. The walls seemed to close in on us while the relentless creature chased into unexplored corners of the asylum. At some point, we decided to split up, hoping that one of us would find a way out and call for help. Heading down yet another forsaken corridor illuminated solely by my dying flashlight beam, I hear Tillman bellowing in pain his scream echoes through the halls like a haunting reminder of our impending doom. Anxiety swells within me my racing heart ready to burst from my chest. I sprint with reckless abandon and stumble upon an area filled with old medical equipment. I find a bottle of industrial alcohol and pocket it who knows when that might come in handy. Stagnant hospital air fills my lungs but there's no time to suffocate on it. I must keep moving. The creature stalked us relentlessly, not seeming to tire. We had split up, hoping that one of us might elude this uncanny beast 
and find a way to call for help. Its deer-like skull with sharp antlers gleamed in the darkness as its elongated limbs propelled it after me. I tried my best to recall if anywhere in the asylum there was a phone or radio we could use to contact the outside world, but my mind was blank. I heard another scream echoing through the abandoned asylum. This time it was Sarah, her voice filled with pain and horror. It made me feel helpless that I couldn't do anything for her. We had been so foolish coming here without telling anyone where we were going. No one knew where to find us. Running through the dark corridors, I spotted a staircase leading down to what looked like a basement level. Desperation urged me on as I hurried down the steps, praying that there would be some way out or something, anything that might be of help. At the bottom of the stairs was a large storage room filled with dusty boxes and old items. My flashlight flickered and went out plunging me into near darkness. Groping around, I found an old set of walkie-talkies inside one of the boxes and turned them on. They crackled with static before one burst into life with Tillman's panicked voice. Hey! Are you guys still alive? I managed to evade that thing for a while, but it's only a matter of time before it finds me again. I found walkie-talkies, I responded, my urgent tone seeping through. We need to call for help somehow. Do any of you see any way out? I haven't yet, Tillman replied breathlessly. But I'll keep looking. We have to hurry. Sarah chimed in with strained determination so evident in her trembling voice. We can't let it find us again. Suddenly, I remembered the bottle of industrial alcohol in my pocket and had an idea. If we couldn't escape, at least we could confront the creature with something to fight back. Listen, guys, I said into the walkie-talkie. I have a bottle of industrial alcohol. If we can somehow set it on fire, maybe we can hurt that monster or buy us some precious time to escape. Sounds like our only plan so far. Tillman agreed over the crackling static. Let's all meet up in the main hall. We'll have more space to move around there and hopefully a better chance against this thing. As we congregated in the dimly lit main hall, our nerves frayed to their breaking point. I lit a rag stuffed into the industrial alcohol bottle with an old lighter I found in one of the dusty boxes. Suddenly, the guttural growl of the creature ripped through the atmosphere from a distance. It was closing in on us. Get ready. I whispered over the sounds of our rapid heartbeats and heavy breathing. It burst onto the scene moments later its grotesque form illuminated by our dying flashlights. It charged at us, but as it reached closer, I hurled our makeshift firebomb at the creature with all my strength. The flaming bottle connected squarely with its awful skull, setting it ablaze amid screams and screeches that filled our ears. Despite being on fire, it continued its relentless pursuit, though it now clearly stumbled in confusion and pain. Using this opportunity to our advantage, we scrambled out from a smashed window near a side exit that led out of this forsaken place. As soon as all three of us were safely outside, struggling for breath and tasting freedom from death's grip, Sarah dialed emergency services on her cell phone, finally realizing she hadn't lost it after all. The police and paramedics arrived and tended to our injuries. They conducted a search of the asylum but found no trace of the otherworldly entity. However, the traumatic events we had experienced still lingered. They were undeniable for us. We were alive, but our hearts bore the memories of this gruesome encounter with this eerie mysterious creature. We could only hope that by some miracle, we had seen the last of it. This happened to me a long time ago. I guess maybe ten years back now. Me and my buddy Kellen spent most summers fishing, hiking, or camping out somewhere along the Pacific coast. We both grew up on the shores of Southern California, 
and you'd be hard-pressed to find two guys more in love with the open wilderness. Back then, I had an interest in photography, just messing around, nothing serious. Kellen knew that. So, when he decided to head up the coast and try out a new, secluded stretch of the Olympic National Park in Washington State, he asked me to come along and document the beauty. Naturally, I jumped at the chance. One sunny morning, we packed up my old RV. It was nothing fancy, but it made those cross-country adventures a whole lot more comfortable. It wasn't exactly an off-road beast, but with Kellen behind the wheel, we had faith. After driving north across the Oregon state line, we turned west, venturing away from the paved highway onto a less certain path. The further along those dirt roads we got, the denser the forest became. Massive fir trees towered over the RV on both sides, their thick canopy almost entirely blotting out the sun. An occasional logging road wound off here and there, but we stayed the course on the wider, unpaved track. As much as I loved the woods, my gut was sending off signals telling me we were straying a bit too far from civilization. We eventually did find a place to pull over, barely any wider than the RV itself. There was a tiny creek running nearby, making it about as idyllic of a spot as we could have hoped for. The first day went off without a hitch. We took a short hike down a nearby trail that had seen significantly more foot traffic than our makeshift road in. Snapped a few shots at sunset, roasted some hot dogs over a crackling fire. Pretty classic first day for one of our trips. It had been so long since we had a summer to indulge in these wilderness escapes, so we savored it. Morning came just as we hoped it would, serene, the air clear and crisp with the faint smell of pine. After a quick breakfast, I grabbed my camera bag and Kellen shouldered his fishing gear. It was time to make good on our adventure. My plan was to wander about, photographing whatever sparked my interest while my buddy tried his luck in the creek. We figured two hours tops before meeting back at the RV for lunch. For quite a while, it was smooth sailing. I found plenty of fascinating fungi to photograph along the banks of the creek. Moss hung low from massive trunks in a dazzling show of nature's handiwork. Even just wandering in aimless loops around our campsite presented captivating visuals. I'd been so caught up I only vaguely noticed time passing. A glance at my watch jolted me. We'd been apart far longer than anticipated. Concerned about Kellen, I started hollering his name, hoping like how my voice would carry through the thick trees. No answer. I pushed the unease down and began heading toward the sound of the creek, figuring he must have just lost track of time chasing trout upstream. That's when I saw the first sign something was terribly wrong. I stumbled upon one of Kellen's fishing rods. It lay snagged in some foliage right on the path. My unease blossomed into full-blown dread. He wouldn't just leave his gear behind. Kellen was a bit of a fanatic, taking meticulous care of all his outdoor equipment. I called out again, this time adding in a bit about finding his rod. Still nothing. I took a deep breath trying to keep a level head. Accidents weren't impossible, after all. Maybe he fell and banged his head? Sprained an ankle? With those possibilities dancing through my mind, I sprinted in the direction of the creek, praying Kellen had taken an unfortunate spill but nothing worse. I crashed through the trees, following the familiar gurgle of the running water. It was hard to tell how far I'd gone. Panic and adrenaline pumped through me, distorting my perception of time and distance. And then, there it was. An open stretch of ground lay right on the creek bank. Not wide, no more than about fifteen feet across. A few old fishing spots could be made out near the water's edge where trampled grass clung to the muddy earth. 
It looked like somewhere folks might go to cast a line from time to time. Nothing extraordinary. Nothing, unless you took in the whole scene. There, splayed amongst the dirt, bits of fabric. Kellen's neon green t-shirt hung half in and half out of the creek, snagged on a jutting rock, the bottom hem stained a deep, dark red. I recognized the shirt instantly. He'd only packed the one. Just a few feet away, trampled into the ground, were Kellen's sunglasses and hat. Scattered about, I could only pick out small items. Bits of metal. Pieces of plastic that may have been part of a pocket knife. And more cloth. Too much cloth. Kellen was gone. And from the looks of things, he hadn't left willingly. I barely felt my knees give way as I staggered back into the undergrowth. Something wasn't right. Nothing felt right about this. Every bit of my being screamed it. No bear, cougar, or other forest-dwelling predator would attack like this. It all seemed planned, methodical, even. Something out there, some person, had snatched my friend. But why? This thought sent a fresh wave of sickening fear coursing through me. If they'd gone after Kellen with those intentions, it wouldn't be long before they got wind of me. I had to get out of there. There was a ranger station. I couldn't be all that far from the trailhead. Surely someone could help. Turning blindly, I broke into a desperate run back towards the sound of the creek. It became a guide, a way forward from the horrors I couldn't allow myself to dwell on. My lungs burned, each desperate gasp mingling with sobs threatening to burst. Every twisted root in my path held the potential for me to go face first into the tangled ground. Every snap of a twig sent a fresh stab of panic through me. Then, a sound that wasn't natural. Something big, moving through the brush ahead. A figure stepped out, blocking my path, and my body came to a shuddering halt. He was immense, easily seven feet tall though hunched over in a posture that would be impossible for most men. His clothes were ragged, patched together in a mismatch of browns and rough denim. An old hunter's cap crowned his head, greasy strands of his dark hair peeking out at odd angles. But that wasn't what registered most immediately. No, it was the weathered leather, stretched, twisted, and formed into a mask covering his entire face. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but warped contours and tanned hide. I couldn't breathe. Could barely scream. Just stared in abject terror. Suddenly, he lunged. I turned with a strangled cry, legs finally taking action after the initial fear froze me in place. Every sound magnified now, the crunch of damp leaves under my pounding feet, the whistling of my breaths the distant howl of a dog back toward the road. He followed close behind, the gap never seeming to widen. With some burst of animal energy, I managed to reach the road and scramble into the driver's seat of the RV. He appeared as suddenly as I felt the keys drop from my fingers and clatter behind a pedal. His hulking frame was practically pressed against the window as I tried to fumble for the ignition. Finally, the engine whined to life. Slamming the RV into drive, I stomped the gas, a desperate lurch merely sending me careening into the dense forest on the other side of the road. That summer ended forever in that single moment. We never found Kellen, or any explanation for what happened in those deep woods. For months, maybe even years after, I refused to speak of it, even to myself. And now I wonder what happened to the leather-masked monstrosity. It couldn't have stayed confined to that wilderness forever. Did it claim more victims? Does it stalk the dark forest still? It chills me to think about, and to wonder if my path will ever cross with those shadowed trees, and that towering figure waiting beneath them, once again.